OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. It's half past seven on this Monday morning. You're welcome along to OTBAM. It's Owen and Nathan with you right the way through until 10 o'clock this morning. We're going to be chatting Rory. We're going to be chatting Limerick. We're going to be chatting about the Ireland against the All Blacks and much more besides over the course of the next few hours. We'd love to hear from you. What was your sporting highlight from that weekend? Uh, you can tweet us at Off The Ball or you can comment on the YouTube stream if that's where you're watching us. Nathan, you were at Croke Park yesterday, I presume also following the events at St Andrews. At uh, what point did you realise that Rory was in a bit of bother or would have to to fight tooth and nail for this thing? Oh, not until very, very, very late in it. Uh, I just sort of thought it was going to happen. And even when Cam Smith went on that run of five birdies in a row at the start of the back nine, you thought Rory would somehow grab a couple at the end and just put too much pressure on them that they wouldn't be able to keep up. But we were on our Golf Weekly watch long yesterday morning and I said that Rory on Saturday felt like he plotted his way around the course. There was nothing too spectacular. There was that one moment out of the bunker, the only bunker he went into all four days, and he managed to hold out of it for Eagle on Saturday, and it was the moment of the tournament, mm. and he felt he was going to kick on from there. And he played very safe and steady golf, and I thought that would be enough for him to get it done yesterday when himself and Victor Hovland had a four-shot lead. Uh, but he needed some fireworks. He needed some momentum. Uh, he needed he needed more birdies, like two birdies over the entire 18 holes, despite hitting every single green in regulation and another big greens at St. Andrews. But he had too many long-range putts and the putts that were makeable early in the round, he didn't take those chances and he left the door open and Cam Smith took full advantage. He certainly did and we're going to get into that in the performance rankings in just a moment. Cam Smith possibly should be in the green but naturally our conversation is going to revolve around Roy McIlroy when we get there in just a moment. So let's tell you what's coming up over the course of the next few hours. We're going to get stuck into the performance rankings in just a moment. Gordon Darcy is going to give us the Irish perspective on what happened on Saturday morning and Gregor Paul, the New Zealand perspective, the fallout from the All Blacks after Saturday morning from 5 to 8. Paul Rick Maher will be with us at 10 past 8 to analyse yesterday's All-Ireland Hurling final. The National O'Reilly is live from the Limerick Team Hotel. So we will be speaking to hopefully some of the members of staff or hopefully some of the players this morning. And Seamus Hickey, former Limerick player himself and part of the squad in 2018, will be with us at 10 past 9. We'll, we're leaving you then But more hurling. Tommy Welsh and his reaction to yesterday's masterclass by Limerick. OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. And at 7.33 on this Monday morning, it is time for the performance rankings you know that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance probably should have won the game based on the second half performance is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup maybe not OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head that performance is we've just lacked that intensity OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day and every week we're giving away a Gillette Labs shaving kit so to be in with a chance of winning just let us know who you think should be in the performance rankings the best place to enter is the off the ball Instagram page you'll see the comments box in our story where you'll be, give, you'll be able to give us suggestions every Sunday night Nathan what are we looking at here first I won't lie this was the greatest weekend of sport in recent memory. I was on to our producer, Colin Buhig, saying, if Rory McIlroy wins, we're not having any red, we're not having any orange, we're going all green. <laughs> all green on the performance rankings. It was that sort of weekend where we could have just gone all green anyways. But because Rory has to end up in the orange, we have decided to have some red. And uh, we're going to start with the All Blacks, who thoroughly deserve to be in red. An absolute shambles uh, yet again at the weekend. First home series lost in almost three decades. A fifth defeat in the last eight games against Ireland. First time since 1998 they suffered back-to-back -back home defeats. And it wasn't even the stats around it. It was just the general performance in that first half where it was all Ireland. It was all Ireland who inflicted it upon them as they built up a 19-point lead. But everything we've sort of come to know and love about the All Blacks as grown up as kids just doesn't feel like it's there anymore. Like the amount of basic errors that they make. Like handling errors. Handling errors from the All Blacks. This is just not what should be happening. And uh, thank God it did happen. Did you grow up to love the All Blacks? I mean, I grew up uh, hating the All Blacks and uh, wanting them to, to lose as much as possible. So I think uh -huh. we should be basking in this. Everything we've grown up to hate and despise about the All Blacks uh, finally is uh, I, 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 had I, our comeuppance. I, I most definitely did not grow up... Uh hating the All Blacks. Why'd you hate the All Blacks? Well, not hating. I mean, just seeing that they were constantly top of the pile and seeing... Yeah, but they were top of the pile and entertaining. Yeah, the top of the pile and also uh, winners in uh, like doing anything to, to win. Maybe they're not growing up and seeing that. Maybe in more recent years, maybe sort of, sort of the Richie McCaw era. Uh, like, I mean, I, I don't have a whole pile of sympathy for New Zealand, basically, is 
is my point. I've got a bit of sympathy for Ian Foster, potentially. I think that maybe what's happened over the last few days, the statement from New Zealand rugby uh, isn't, I, I don't think does anybody any favours, really. I think uh, John Kerwin came out and actually said that they should be backing him or they should at least, you know, make clear their statement and make clear their intent over the, the next few months with regards to what they want to do with the head coach, whereas it feels like Ian Foster's in a very tricky position right now. So I, f- I feel a bit of sympathy for him and, and that situation, but... Other than that, I think the All Blacks will most definitely be back and this is a, a temporary break from greatness, isn't it? Well, they they got to make the decision quickly. They said it was unacceptable, they're going to have a thorough review, but the next game is away to South Africa. So if you decide to stick with Ian Foster mm-hmm. and then you go to South Africa and you get absolutely beaten up, well, then you're on the back foot for the entire rugby championship. So why not make the decision now? Like They have two of the most sought-after coaches in world rugby waiting in the wings either Scott Robertson or Joe Schmidt. Could you combine the two of them? Can you give Robertson the job and Schmidt work in the background? Are their styles of rugby, are their management philosophy so different that that couldn't happen? Like, do they want a Joe Schmidt? Like, do they want, I'm sure they would take the lens Joe Schmidt. Do they want the Joe Schmidt from Ireland and the incredibly dull rugby that Ireland played in his last couple of years in charge? Is that what the All Blacks need when we're talking about handling errors and just getting back to the basics and getting a job done at the World Cup over the 18 months? It is going to be fascinating. You do expect that they will bounce back, but maybe they don't. Maybe the players aren't there. Maybe this group of All Blacks just isn't of the quality of teams that went before. Maybe they're. Maybe we should be looking to get the All Blacks in a World Cup quarterfinal, uh, considering the record that Ireland have them now, rather than fearing it and spending the next 18 months fretting about it. Yeah, I think, well, the, the power of rugby has shifted now. It's South Africa and France that you want to be avoiding o- over the, the course of the World Cup next year. And even then, South Africa looked far from perfect uh, in this, this this summer series. So maybe it's just France. Maybe France are the only team that you definitely want to avoid. Now, to be fair, it's the, the old conversation around Ireland and maybe their power game. Maybe that wasn't as uh, an, an acute factor over the last three weeks as it would be against South Africa or France. And maybe there'll be a bit of a, a rude awakening for Ireland in November when they come up against South Africa. Maybe again next spring when they play France. I, I don't think they're is, um, anybody's thinking about that right now we will get to Ireland in just a moment but it was uh, an absolutely fantastic morning for them on, on Saturday morning but the, just to kind of like p- put a bit of meat in the bones of what the New Zealand rugby actually said over the course of the weekend so you had the chief executive Mark Robinson coming out and basically uh, issued a statement saying congratulations to Ireland on their win but clearly the performance was not acceptable as we know they have reflected we all know there's a huge amount of work to do our focus now is to work with Ian and his team to understand thoroughly in advance of the rugby championship what is needed to improve performance and where to go from here we will begin this work immediately that says to me you got to have a successful rugby championship or it's curtains but that's a waste of time Mm. do it now do it in the next couple of weeks rugby championship what have you got left then before the world cup to properly prepare like if you're a new coach coming in and trying to implement something against South Africa, these should learn a lot instantly. But I think if you stick with them through the rugby championship, you probably got to stick with them all the way to the World Cup. Yeah, sixth of August is when that kicks off. So it's not a whole pile of time. They're straight into it basically when it comes to a camp in a couple of weeks. You'd imagine. Uh, a couple of comments on that. Mark Dunning says, "How can anyone hate Jonah Lomu? That is the All Blacks I grew up with, exactly. and it was class watching him run over England backs in 1995." I can't disagree with that. that. See, I keep forgetting that. You know, your generation, my generation are very different generations. I, yeah. you know, they were the Harlem Globetrotters when I was growing up, yeah. whereas they were the big nasty beasts by the time you know you were watching them. It's just all nightmares everywhere. Look, nightmares about the All Blacks. Kilkenny also in the red this morning, Nathan. Very harshly, I think. Very harsh. Now, I, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm separating myself from this. I, they Me should too. be in the orange. I, I don't believe Kilkenny should be in the red whatsoever uh, for what happened yesterday but somebody else fault to is this the red. Uh, Colin Buhig again yeah, uh, he's from Cork so this underlines uh, his hatred for all things Kilkenny uh, so just whatever clips go out I want this at the start that I do not endorse Kilkenny being in the red but uh, listen I think any other side in that All-Ireland final yesterday get beaten by 10 points it was just the sheer doggedness of Kilkenny that somehow they managed to stick at it They'll have regrets. They will definitely have regrets. It wasn't a perfect performance, despite the fact they ran up a huge score, 226, and pushed Limerick as close as they possibly could. Like, their puck out was a disaster in the early stages. I was sitting right in line with it, and I couldn't figure out what was quite going on because they conceded 1-4 off it. There was too many double scores, too many easy double scores for Limerick. When they got a point, the puck out came straight back to them, and they got another point, which, you know, built up a deficit that they could never come back from Kilkenny. But 
Hugh Lawler is standing 10 yards in front of Owen Murphy and three or four times the ball to Lawler was either too high, it was too fast, he wasn't quite ready for it, his touch was slightly off and even though Limerick were standing back and they were standing 10 feet, like they allowed them to swarm in and sort of put in place a sense of panic in Kilkenny early on that, that really didn't need to be there and it maybe it was the occasion but it, it felt like it was just it was a basic skill a basic execution and I, I don't think anyone's ever criticised Owen Murphy you can't really but like these were simple things at the start of an All-Ireland final that you have to get right and they missed a lot of chances I was surprised to see afterwards I think it was 10 wides apiece it felt as though Kilkenny had had a lot more wides and a lot more scoreable wides it definitely felt you look at some of those scores that Kilkenny, uh, Limerick got in the closing stages from out on the left-hand side, Kilkenny missed four or five of them, probably under less pressure, mm. where they just uh, pulled us and it went to the left, and all of those things come together and you end up losing the game by two points. It did feel on the day that no matter what Kilkenny did, Limerick were going to win that game, that they yeah. would always, always just have enough. But the fact that you know when Richie Hogan comes on and gets that monster point, that it draws them level with seven minutes left, is in itself an achievement, I think, considering how great this Limerick team are. And yeah, Kilkenny, I don't think there'll be any great post-mortem about this. I don't think there'll be any questioning of Brian Cody and whether there needs to be a change. Like This was an All-Ireland final for the ages, and Kilkenny were a big, big part of that. I, I think that the point on the wides is interesting, because in the first half, I felt that Kilkenny were putting everything over the bar, that every, every time they got the ball in their hands in the, the opposition half, or every opportunity they got, they were taking, and I kind of felt that their luck, not their luck, but their accuracy was going to run out eventually. And I, I haven't looked at the breakdown of the stats, but it kind of feels, of the 10 wides, probably eight of them were in the second half. I could be wrong, but that's kind of what I felt like, that it was the second half where Kilkenny started to get wasteful, that they were making every opportunity count in the first half. And that's probably the thing that will sting for Cody, is that they proved in the first half that they have that accuracy to, to, to nail the vast majority of their scoring opportunities. And if they'd done that in the second half, you could have been looking at a replay, even though it felt that Limerick were, at times, a much better side than Kilkenny. And I think that is testament to Kilkenny. I don't think too many other teams, maybe Galway, could have lived with that uh, Limerick performance yesterday. It was absolutely excellent. And the Hogan score under the Hogan stand, for me as well, felt like that, that was going to be significant or there was something poetic about him coming on and, and nailing that equaliser. But Limerick, as they proved against Galway, that home stretch push is where they kill you. And it's just like the dubs were a few years ago. The reason for that is not just down to fitness and the, the, the physique of all the players, but also the players that are coming off the bench. That They're awesome, like even Boylan coming off and, and getting a, a pretty inspirational score. Carl O'Neill, who's going to be a superstar coming off the bench. Like That is serious cavalry to bring on. And we'll get to Limerick in a, in a moment on that, but the fact that they didn't even have Keane Lynch yesterday is, is a pretty scary prospect when you consider what's going to happen over the next few years. It's interesting that you talk about uh, Cody and all the time we've spent over the last few years questioning whether or not he's the, the right man for the job. It feels that his job is more secure than ever now, that he can't possibly be questioned and that he's almost leading a team that are as well-placed as anybody to try and stop the four in a row and maybe the five in a row over the next two years. Well, we don't know what's next from Limerick. Like, was that the peak? Was that the peak of Limerick yesterday? Or was it 12 months ago and they're slowly coming back to the pack? It, it doesn't really feel like it. It feels like that's still on their biggest day. As you said, that final stretch in every game, they always had enough. And they'll start next season rightly as, as overwhelming favourites. But Kilkenny right now look the most settled. They look the best of the rest. Like they've got changes coming as well. You know, are we going to see Richie Hogan again uh, making an impact off the bench? Is that it done? I would hope not because you know the, the atmosphere around the ground changed completely when Richie Hogan came off, uh, came on for Kilkenny yesterday. So, yeah, I think I think Kilkenny are going to be there, thereabouts. And to say, like, it is just that doggedness. I think any other team yesterday wilts under the pressure from Limerick very early in the game. But they made it very difficult for themselves because mm. of the start. And listen, it was a magic, magic moment from Garold Hegarty, one of the great All-Ireland final goals. Unreal. But the puckouts killed them early on and you know they never led after that. They were never able to get themselves in front coming back from that early deficit. That, that being said, the, was the puck out strategy just to get the ball to TJ uh, ASAP? And like, I mean, if you've got TJ Reid in your team, it's not the worst tactic in the world. We will get Park Mara's take on that. Well, but if it was, but it was the initial execution of the short pass when they were going short that constantly broke down. It was, you know, it was a little, little puck 10 yards that goes into the defender's hands 10 times out of 10. But 
they were drop balls, there was a bit of nervousness, it allowed Limerick to pounce and I think just gave them a bit of energy off the Kilkenny puckouts that they really didn't need to get. Rory McIlroy is in the amber this morning. Nathan, a couple of people disagreeing with you on that. Richard Redball says, how is Rory not in red? And Noel Cal makes a point that did cross my mind when you were talking about Rory at the top of the show. Do you think Rory would have played better if Hovland... Do you think Rory would have won if Hovland had played better? And maybe if, there were, maybe if his playing partner was uh, Cam Smith, maybe it would have uh, upped Rory's game a little bit more? I don't think so. I think you have to ignore all of these things. How did Tiger Woods' playing partners play in his 15 majors? Like You forget about your playing partner. It's not about them. You go and do it yourself. And Victor Hovland didn't have a very good day, but you got to ignore him. And would Rory McIlroy have been run over by the momentum of Cam Smith? The reason he's in orange was because it was a very good week for McIlroy. It's been a very good season for McIlroy. He has finished in the top 10 of all four majors for the first time in his career. But it needed to be a great day yesterday for McIlroy to win this. And he just didn't have it. He just didn't have that spark for whatever reason. And like yesterday felt like arguably the momentous day of his career so far. If he won yesterday, he moves on to five majors alongside Seve Ballesteros. And everything we've spoken about over the last eight years, we look at it in a completely different light. Suddenly, he's on course to become the greatest European golfer of all time, the best of the post-Tiger generation. And the momentum to kick on over the next few years, I, I think winning an Open Championship yesterday makes it easier for him to win the Masters in eight months' time, easier for him to finish the career Grand Slam. And it just felt he was so primed for it after the first three days. He was playing so well. He was playing within himself. He looked very comfortable. He felt very confident. And it felt written in the stars that the 150th Open Championship at St. Andrews, are you a great major champion if you've never won an Open at St. Andrews? And he's become this beacon for, well, right, or for uh, the righteous maybe more in the PGA Tour against Live Golf and that this was going to be his reward. And I say, even watching it at Crow Park and then rushing home afterwards to watch the back nine, you're just waiting for something to happen. It felt as though he was going to go on a run at some stage, and next thing the tournament was over. Yeah. Just like that, the, the 16, 17, 18, they go in a flash, and you kept waiting for Rory to, to birdie 16 or 17, to put himself in a position where at the very least he'd have a playoff, and then... Cam Smith, you know, he gets the birdie on 18, suddenly he's on 20 under and, and it's gone for Rory. He just, he, he, it, it's left behind and I, it'll be a difficult one to take. He didn't blow up yesterday. Like there's, you know, this isn't his first ever Masters uh, where there's significant scar tissue. But there is definitely a concern at his age that he will look back and go, you know, I finished top 10 in all four majors. I didn't win one. I've had a really good season. I've played really good golf, won the Canadian Open, and still couldn't win a major. And it's such a long wait now. It's such a ridiculously condensed season where we've four majors in four months, and now there's nothing for eight months. Like, we go into the FedEx Cup, and he can win as many of them as he wants and win the DP World Tour title and all of that sort of stuff. But none of it really matters to McElroy at this stage, aside from winning majors. So I don't think he deserves to be in red. I don't think, you know, I don't think this was a blow-up. I don't think it was anything horrific from Rory. Uh, I think Orange is definitely the spot for him, but yeah, incredibly frustrating that you know he couldn't really respond to what Cam Smith did yesterday. It, it is Bob is possibly the most frustrating Rory McIlroy watch ever because it's not, as you say, the, the agonising explosion at the end of Augusta when he comes so close all those years ago. Like Richard Redballs have been back in touch to say only sh shooting two under in those conditions yesterday. He has no reason to complain about not winning. And he's not complaining about not winning. He came out afterwards. He fronted up and said. I mean, I wasn't good enough to win today, and I think that his his own inability to get birdies on that home stretch was was what screwed him, and he was pretty open about that. And Fergus Keogh says, "Rory, great golfer, seventeen top tens, nine top fives since the last major, but let's stop kidding ourselves. He will never win another. Its probability is that he he will, but I mean, it's bloody hard to get over the line, especially when someone like Cam Smith comes roaring down the line uh, at you. Or the alternative here is that this being arguably his best ever major season, and he comes away with zero trophies from it." what will the scar tissue of that be? And what will happen over the next eight months when he has to kind of sit on this? Like, could this potentially be be the most damaging four tournaments of his of his career, despite the fact that he's got four top 10 finishes in, in the four majors? Well, he's only the third player in the last 50 years to finish eighth or better in all four majors and not win one of them. You had Ricky Fowler in 2014, Ben Crenshaw in 1987, and now Rory McIlroy. It's very rare that a player will go through 
a final round of a major uh, in the lead, uh, not have a single bogey all day, hit every green all day and still not win the tournament. And St Andrews was tricky this week. They put the pins in difficult positions. There wasn't a huge amount of birdie opportunities from on the back nine on Sunday or on Saturday. Like there was a lot of a lot of lag putting, so a lot of putts from sort of fifty feet that he was putting brilliantly and having easy pars. And yesterday a couple early on, a couple of makeable birdie putts that if he had one of them you felt maybe he would have just kicked on from there. But again, just wasn't close enough on a lot of the approach shots. You know, he was getting up, he was having easy pars, he never really looked like he was going to drop too many shots. Is that the mentality thing then? where he was just happy enough to, to go shoot a 70 yesterday? Well, he said himself he felt he'd have to shoot 68. He felt he'd have to get to 20 under par. And looking but does Rory need to be morning, aiming for 64, really? If Rory's going out saying, I, I, I'm happy enough for the 68, is that actually part of the, the, the reason why he got held back yesterday? But he didn't need to shoot a 64 at the time in that going out with a four-shot lead alongside Victor Hovland, the two of them four shots clear of everyone else. Like If he gets to 20 under par, he's thinking, well, Cam Smith has to shoot 64 to get to 20 under par. Now, it turns out Cam Smith was able to shoot 64 to get to 20 under par. Do you go out and be that aggressive? Like, Cam Smith had to be incredibly aggressive because he was coming from behind. And there's always a party when you have that sort of lead that's going to be conservative. And in hindsight, absolutely yes. Uh, He needed to be more aggressive at times. But the way he was playing, I think he thought... He would hold some putts. Like his putting has been exceptional all year. His putting in the first couple of rounds, he was, you know, first hole, first day, holds a 55 footer for birdie. Uh, he was holding a lot of those over the first couple of days. It just didn't quite happen for him uh, over the next couple. And what happens next? Like who knows? Like who knows right now where the golfing world is going to be come next April and the Masters at Augusta. You know, we had. I wouldn't say we had a live free four days, but definitely. Well, the Open Championship and 150th anniversary, like they went to town on the history and Jack Nicholas was there and Tiger spoke emotionally about what it meant to him at St. Andrews and we had the incredible scenes on Friday night of Tiger walking over the Swilkin Bridge and it felt like this was golf trying to remind itself that it wasn't just all about the money and that lasted about 15 minutes yesterday when Cam Smith was asked about it didn't take kindly to the question and basically said, I don't know, uh, talk to my advisors. I leave all that sort of stuff to them, which wasn't absolutely convincing. Oh. Uh, there's a lot of stories that the way Live Golf are now going is by trying to put together teams by nationality. So we've already seen South African teams and English teams that Greg Norman's trying to put together an Australian team with Mark Leishman, Adam Scott and Cam Smith, a huge part of that. And to go and get the champion golfer of the year within a couple of weeks would be an unbelievable coup. They don't have a top 10 player in the world. There's talk that he could be getting anywhere between 80 and 100 million to go. Now, there was another interview where he said he's looking forward to the FedEx Cup playoffs. So we don't exactly know. But the other seismic story last night was that there's enormous speculation around Henrik Stenson. There have been murmurings of this for quite a few weeks, but everyone assumed even though all of Stenson's uh, contemporaries, Poulter, Garcia, McDowell, have all gone, that Stenson has taken the Ryder Cup captaincy. He is the European Ryder Cup captain for Italy next year. But there are many stories coming out of St. Andrews last night that Stenson is going to go. He's going to quit as captain. Well, he'll be sacked as captain instantly and is going to take the money and run, which would be as big a setback as there has been for the European Tour and puts them in a heck of a quandary as to what what do they do? Like, their captain has walked out of them. This has never happened before. So I have no idea. I don't think anyone can really predict what's going to happen over the next six, eight months and the impact of Live Golf. But this week is the last time we're going to see all the best players on the golf course together until at least Augusta next year. Uh, You know, it could well be the last time this week we ever saw Sergio Garcia played an Open Championship. He says he's going to quit the European Tour. It doesn't look right now as though they're going to get world ranking points. I think that players who are past champions at Augusta will get in again. I think past champions at the US Open and the Open, if they have an exemption to their 60, will get to do that. But if they don't have world ranking points, everybody is going to crash out of the world's top 100 over the next six months. So you are not going to get in unless you are already exempt. And that's going to mean an awful lot of those players are going to miss out on the majors. But again, maybe maybe the European Tour and the PGA Tour see the writing is on the wall and feel they have absolutely no choice 
uh, but to somehow go into bed with live golf. But yeah, it's escalating rapidly. For sure. Uh, last couple of bits on the performance rankings, which we'll have loads of time to get into later on, is Ireland and Limerick. Anything you want to say before we uh, speak to the experts this morning, Nathan? Oh, like Limerick yesterday, I just thought the heat of the day, the atmosphere around Crow Park, uh, to do three in a row, four and five years, 16 matches unbeaten in the championship. Like they are, they're just a joy to watch. Like there's no question they are heading towards a rightful comparison with that Kilkenny side and Garrod Hegarty to score one five, his performance in finals, three fourteen from play in three All Ireland finals. And it was men against boys stuff. Like even from way back in the stands, he looks about a foot taller uh, than everybody else. I uh, was in his shadow down in Adair Manor uh, for about three hours as we both followed uh, Tiger Woods. He got quite a bit closer to Tiger Woods uh, than I didn't. He's having many conversations uh, with Tiger Woods, but he is a mountain mm -hmm. of a man, uh, incredibly nice guy and couldn't be more happy from putting in that performance and just the sheer ambition to go and score that goal right at the start of the game uh, like the power the power behind that shot I just thought it was a everything about it was a was a brilliant day and obviously Saturday morning in Ireland like the first half like if you didn't know again if you were growing up in my day and you didn't and it was still in black and white home you would have thought Ireland were the All Blacks in that first half uh, such was the quality of, uh, of their performance uh, the other highlight which hasn't been touched on enough was Will Jordan's try and Johnny Sexton tried to keep up with him like, I mean yeah Will Jordan's absolutely incredible uh, like uh, Ty Byrne the last 10 minutes uh, as good as it gets like considering Ty Byrne it felt there was you know, he was maybe the former Irish player for so much of the season and then like a lot of the Munster players we didn't really know where they were because the season petered out so much but to have those energy levels in the last 5-10 minutes number one ranked team in the world everyone's saying the greatest ever achievement and I think people should just appreciate it get away from the World Cup like there's too much of an obsession with the World Cup yes Ireland may go to the next World Cup and they may again struggle to get past the quarter final and you talk to O'Driscoll O'Gara all these guys know that they failed at World Cups it doesn't mean that everything happens in between is a complete failure because you don't win that game and I think it's done huge damage to Irish rugby the obsession with the World Cup because it feels as though we're not allowed to appreciate anything along the way so URC Champions Cup oh well they can deliver there but can they deliver in the World Cup win a Six Nations but is it peaking too early beat the All Blacks well do it in a year's time actually all these things stand alone for their greatness and a million different things can change over the next year so worry about the World Cup when it comes along absolutely if Ireland get beaten in a quarter final if they don't even get out of their group it's an underachievement it's a disaster at the time but it doesn't mean that beating the All Blacks is in any ways lessened we're not going to look back are we going to look back in 15 months time and say that was a waste of time winning a test series in New Zealand absolutely I don't not. think so yeah it was pretty class on uh, Saturday morning to say the least uh, we do have Gordon Darcy on standby to put some meat in the bones of that conversation in just a moment as well but for this Monday morning that is your Gillette performance rankings OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette now, just a quick reminder that Brayburn Coffee is the official coffee partner to OTB. And each week we're giving one lucky viewer a €100 Euro voucher to spend on some Brayburn coffee goodness at an Apple Green store near you. To enter, check out at Off The Ball on Twitter. Just like and retweet our Brayburn competition posts and you're in the draw. Brayburn Coffee is Apple Green's new premium coffee brand that offers customers the best coffee experiences on the road. Available now at 30 locations nationwide. Up next, we're going to reflect on that Ireland win on Saturday morning alongside Gordon Darcy and Gregor Paul. But before that, here's Limerick manager John Kiley and his post-match reaction to yesterday's results. John, congratulations. Absolutely epic game out there. Two exceptional teams. And I think when we're watching Limerick, I think we're watching a team that's really going to go down in history. Yeah, I think, you know, they've, what they've achieved today has just been very, very special for the group. Um, you know, I suppose this is the first one probably with the whole crowd back as well, which is special as well. You know, there was certain things said about the last two, which, you know, would be demeaning of those. But, you know, we knew the value of them. We knew the worth of them. And we knew how much we had put into them and how much every other team had put into them as well. But today was just the culmination of a really, really tough season for us. We had a lot of setbacks during the course of the year with injuries and God knows what not, but it was really tough and uh, just really thrilled for the lads. Their performance was exceptional today and, you know, when things did go against them, they didn't panic, they kept great composure, minded the ball well in that last quarter and 
when there was somebody needed to take the ball from one of the lads today in the last quarter, there was always one or two people available. And that was really the key part of it. They were always there for each other in that last quarter and had the, you know, the courage to take on the chances that were presented to Peter, to Connor, to Aaron, Dermot, Cahill, David. You know, they all got great chances in that last quarter and they all took them and nailed them. And uh, I'm delighted for the lads. Yeah, to do that under that pressure, to be out there and that noise, as you've said, it was electric out there. What was it like on the sideline for you? Could they hear you? Were your shit went on? They didn't hear much today, I don't think. And they're probably better off, but... Uh, no, listen, it was, it was an incredible cauldron of noise today and it was just a really special game, you know. We've only played Kikini a few times as a group, you know, Turles in 18, an incredible game. And 19 here, another incredible game, down to the last puck of the ball. So I knew today, coming into this, and we all knew that this was going to be a really, really tough challenge. And, you know, all credit to Kilkenny, they're just an incredible county, an incredible side. You know, Brian always brings a huge, huge battle with his team. And uh, we're, we're uh, thrilled and very proud of our performance to be able to come out on top. And what does it mean to you, John? You, your family, your daughters? I know they're your first port of call a lot of the time. When the whistle goes, you see them straight away afterwards in the stands. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm just making sure they haven't skied it off anyhow. But uh, no, listen, it's great for them. And listen, we are one big family, you know, within our group. And, you know, we can't do this on our own. And for all the players and their partners and families, you know, it means a huge amount to them as well because they know the sacrifices that have been made. There's lots of nights and days you should be other places, but you're with the team and you're doing what you've got to do. And for them to be able to share in occasions like today, these are the memories that they'll have when they're older. And I keep telling them, make sure and remember these occasions because they're, they're just going to be treasures that you'll have when you're older. Yes, yeah, some of them had their, their babies out there as well on the pitch. There's a few of them, yeah. They're uh, bringing the next generation along. And uh, yeah, listen, these are family, special moments for all these guys. And I'm delighted for them to have that. Brilliant, John. Thanks for your time. Thank Congratulations. You, Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Limerick manager John Kiley in conversation with Ashling O'Reilly after their win yesterday against Kilkenny in the All Ireland hurling final. We'll have plenty more reaction on that between now and 10 o'clock. But it was a massive weekend of sport and it all got underway on Saturday morning with New Zealand's 22, Ireland 32 in the third test down under. And it means that Ireland win the series 2 1. Delighted to welcome Gordon Darcy and Gregor Paul back to the show. Uh, Gordon, we'll start with yourself. Andy Farrell said that this tour was going to be, and the grueling nature of it all, is going to be a real test of what the players are made of. I guess we learned on Saturday morning what these players are made of. Yeah, I think that's probably uh, uh, yeah, what the players met up, but also what the coaching tickets um, achieved as well. And I think there's a great harmony between the uh, those players and the uh, and the coaching and the coaching staff. Um, yeah, there was um, massive pressure in the in the second test. The weather that, um, but I think they had all those going into the into the third test, and I think the way they managed the second half was absolutely oh. phenomenal. So there was lots of questions posed. Well, there was question posed, not as many as you would have expected New Zealand to pose, um, or traditionally would expect them to, to pose. Um, but Ireland had had answers for pretty much every every game from the second test on. We've got two additional fantastic guests on the line for anybody joining us yes. on YouTube. Gordon, uh, t- tell us about your dogs there very briefly. Um, yeah, <laughs> they were sitting quite calmly um, away from me there a second ago um, and uh, decided to come and say hello. Oh, they are uh, absolutely fantastic additions. What are their names? Albert and Barney. Well, you're very welcome, Albert and Barney. It is brilliant to have you on the show. That's exactly what we need on this Monday morning. Uh, Gordon, can I ask what changed in your view between the first test and the second and third tests? Uh, like, like uh, it's the, the obvious bits of... Um, Ireland won their set piece. I think it was uh, between the first and the second test. I think it was uh, Ireland did to New Zealand what New Zealand did to Ireland the first test. They crowded their line out. They hassled. They, um, you know, they just really just harangued the the New Zealand line out, um, and they won their own. And the scrum time, you know, Tig Tig uh, Furlong and Porter just set down set down the tone. And Sexton played first and did two minutes. And I think that's probably that. You know, the, you've got the set piece, and then you have Sexton playing. You know, seventy plus minutes. That for me was the was the was the telling telling piece. When it comes to that set piece area, then was it a, a sense today? Was it new moves that you saw in the, the second and third test? Was it just kind no, of fine tuning? No, it's just the, it's just the winning of the ball. Like mm-hmm. we we were under pressure in the first test. I said, you know, uh, Whitelock uh, was very good in the Irish on the Irish uh, ball 
in the first test and he wasn't there for the for the second test um but James Ryan like you can just see I I, I, I can I can almost see O'Connell and Ryan and she and sitting down for a lot of time um uh, in the build up to that uh play in the build up to that second test no 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 um, no yeah and then the, the, the I guess the the, the additional then kind of like fine tuning of it O'Connell and his fingerprints have been all over it for for the last little while but to turn like there was a lot there was a lot going wrong with that in the line out of the first in the first test and uh, the set and the and, and the um and the and the scrum and that's why it looked like it was going to be a long series everybody's looking to say you know because the, the set piece is so fundamental to how how what Ireland need to do um so the ability to turn that around like James Ryan was exceptional at line out in the second test i was re- it was like you know, he was it's almost like he was reborn and went in. It was great. It was really, and that was, I, would, I think that was really, really important to watch. Uh, it wasn't, uh, sorry, there was more tempo into it and there was thing, but they really harassed the New Zealand line out, which meant they weren't harassing ours. They were concentrating on winning their ball, which played in Ireland's hands. Uh, Gregor, this is what happens when Ireland win in New Zealand. We get the dogs on. The kids want to make an appearance as well. Uh, <laughs> Your boys took one hell of a beating on Saturday and the fallout probably isn't going to be too pretty. First home series defeat in almost three decades. Back to back at home for the first time since 98. Uh, the fallout, what has it been like over the last couple of days? Oh, quite intense, as you would imagine, because they, they lost the series, but that, that's on the back of a few defeats um, at the end of last year as well. And so they've played what, Ireland four times and lost three of those four. And I mean, that's probably unthinkable. Um, if we go back five, 10 years, that would never, ever have happened. You know, Ireland can never beat the All Blacks and now they're sort of beating them 75% of the time. So we've had this fundamental shift in the world order. And look, I, I think everyone can see that you look at the All Black team and um, there's some excellent players in that team. And it, we're not seeing a lot of players outside of that squad who are not currently being picked. So we don't think there's a selection issue per se with maybe one or two players that they might have a little look at and bring in. So they've got a, they've got the right players out on the park. But, you know, all credit to Ireland who are a naughty team at the moment playing particularly well. But they, I guess because they were so good, they've exposed a whole raft of issues in that all back team from a set piece that was dominant in Test 1 to one that was under all sorts of pressure and set in test two and three. The, the real question marks around the all black forwards at the moment. And and that's all leading into a discussion around, well, if we've got the right players on the park and they all look quite good when they play super rugby and we all know they can play. Um the right coaching group around them at the moment because Ireland Ireland grew throughout that series, didn't they? That was the thing that changed everything. Ireland found a a, a, a level higher in, in the second test and they went up another level in the third test and you could see you know Gordon talking there about James Ryan you saw the growth in him he became the best lock on the field throughout the series and New Zealand didn't get that growth out of their players and there's questions now whether this coaching group has got the ability to you know to find answers around set pace around the breakdown work it was messy and look their attack game attack game was non-existent for long periods and, you know, Ireland find it really far too easy to break their front line of defence. So there's issues now around whether New Zealand are tackling, you know, whether they've got their heads in, in the right space when they start, because Ireland scored a try, I think, in each test within five minutes. And New Zealand's big priority was to start well, and it didn't happen in any of those. So like, we're, we're, we're talking pretty seriously about whether this coaching group will be retained to the, through to the World Cup or not. Yeah, like they get the rugby championship, and is it a decision after that then? Well, I mean, they're off to South Africa in a couple of weeks, so it would be a pretty tight turnaround to, to boot one lot of coaches out and get another one in there before they go. I mean, it's not unfeasible because the guy that everyone's talking about taking over is Scott Robertson, and he's under contract to New Zealand Rugby. He's a Crusaders coach, so they, they effectively have him. Um, so they could do that if he could put together a, a team around him, which I think he probably could because most of his guys would, would be involved in Super Rugby at the moment, so he could get them out of there quickly. But, but realistically, I think they'll make a decision when they get home from... They've got to play two tests in South Africa. I, I don't think they'll be able to make a decision about what they're going to do until those are finished. Okay, so it, it's essentially the, the rugby championship to, to save his job, is it? No, it'll no. be the two tests against Sorry. South Africa to save his job. Yeah. 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 I don't okay. think he'll get the whole rugby... If they come home beaten up in Africa, and I mean, Jeebers 
you know, it doesn't get any easier, does it? You play Ireland, who are probably number one team in the world, despite the rankings, and look, South Africa and South Africa, they won't be subtle, uh, and we know what they're going to do, but that's where the All Blacks look a wee bit vulnerable at the moment, is to that power, that big uh, set-piece power game, big collision work, um, and Africa bring that, South Africa bring that at a level that will probably be even greater than, than Ireland. Yeah, it's a it's a hell of a start to, to the rugby championship for New Zealand, to, to say the least, with those two tests. Uh, Gordon, uh, w- when you look back at that game on Saturday morning, was the way in which Ireland responded to the All Blacks being the All Blacks in that third quarter as impressive as that first half performance? Yeah, I think I think so. Um, I wasn't surprised overly because I, there's very few weeks uh, in, a, in, in a rugby player's career where you go into that uh, uh, third test and you've done all the work you've you've won the ser- you've won the you've won the tour and you've got a free run of it like they were fresh they didn't they wouldn't have had to do much it was all about getting mentally prepared and they didn't have any real injuries going into that uh, into that third test and I thought the way they managed it was really really good um, they took more kicks at goal than you would have tradition than they had done in the previous ones they were they just applied pressure to New Zealand and it took up until around 55, 60 minutes for the New Zealand players to really start to kind of buckle under that, under that pressure. They had one, probably one or two moments where they could have stole it. Um, and Ireland came back and the fact that Herring scored that try in the final thing was just, was just delightful to watch. Um, because there's, I don't know, there was, there was always a moment where you kind of with New, there's always a, with with New Zealand where you kind of go, oh, they could just score two tries back to back here. You always had that, but as the game progressed, you kind of went, oh, I'm not really sure they're going to do this. The Ardi Savia try, it was, it, it just looked like him taking the game by the scruff of the neck rather than anything New Zealand, you know, organised and d- delivering. Um, and you just felt like he kind of almost ran out of steam after he scored that try, and there wasn't anybody else that was able to able to turn it on for New Zealand. And I think that Gregory was kind of pointed, like the talking about the the players on the field from from a you know watching the New Zealand players on the field that just didn't seem to be you know both part doing his best to try and create something, but there just didn't seem to be any ability to change the tempo of the game by New Zealand and Ireland, particularly Johnny Sexton and Gibson Park, just smothered them there. That uh, momentum that New Zealand were building, like we grew up on uh, all black sides, that when they got that momentum, Gordon, that they took advantage and Ireland would wilt and they would run up a big score very quickly. The, the reasons for that not happening then, obviously a lot of them on the all black side, but from an Ireland point of view, before the Herring try, what were you seeing? Was, was, that, was that Sexton getting everybody together? You know, wh- who were the leaders there that actually made sure that Ireland's heads didn't drop? Oh, but like, uh, you know, in, that, in the third test, there was no danger of the heads dropping. Like they've just beaten, they've won that first test in, uh, in they won the second test in, in New Zealand. So they knew all they had to do was play on the front foot. Um, so, yeah, like, and I can't overemphasize how important winning the set piece is for this group of players. Once we win our set piece, the way Ireland play, it's very, very, very hard to defend because it's simple. You know, once you're over the game line, defenses have to go backwards to go around. Gibson Park is already there before the defenses are there, and they're moving the ball. So it just becomes this. Uh, virtuous circle of, of of play, and it's not always scoring tries, but it is eroding the energy of the of the opposition team. And we did that really, really well um, for the whole uh, the whole element, the whole time of the, of, of the game. In the first test, um, New Zealand did that kind of power play piece where it was just a jaded looking Irish Irish squad at the, at that point in time where they got that two three tries they got that 14 18 points the game was just out of reach um i think the defenses the defense definitely responded to the way new zealand were playing and i think the numbers that ireland were burning at the rook in the second and third test versus the first test was very different and we left less holes in the in the in the field and New Zealand struggled with that, and I think Peter Omani, our our breakdown players, had a bigger game in the in the third test as well. I think Ty Byrne was immense. Caelan Doris, Peter Omani, they were they were incredible at the breakdown, and New Zealand struggled because they 
the I think the rooks. Um, it'd be interesting to see what Gregor thinks about this as well. The rooks in the northern hemisphere versus the southern hemisphere are very seem to be very very different. In the way they're reft and the way they're um, and the way we we focus on them, and I think New Zealand struggled to get to grips with them. Yeah, do you want to pick that up, Gregor? Yeah, they, well, they did. New Zealand's whole game plan, um, probably going back ten years, has been built entirely on speed of recycled ball. You know, when you know, and the fact there was a stat last year, I think Ian Foster mentioned that when even last year, if the All Blacks can have two consecutive phases where they go forward and recycle the ball quickly. They were scoring tries last year, just on the back of two phases quickly, ball comes back. They, they were that good um, at, at doing it. And that's all they needed to create the, the the frisson of momentum that they needed to get moving. But Ireland were just so good at, at not, I mean, I don't recall any particular prolonged periods of play where New Zealand were able to recycle the ball in the areas of the field where they wanted to, um, at the speed that they needed to to play the game that Ireland were playing, once they breach you, they're, they're almost impossible to stop. And look, I mean, credit to Ireland, their clean-out work was fantastic. Maybe there's a little bit of, um, I wouldn't use the word cynicism, I don't mean that cruelly, but they, they were really good at getting in the way and rolling out the all-black side of the of the rack, and they, they got away with it. Good play to them. And, you know, so Smith was always kind of clearing out an Irish defender. He couldn't get his hands on the ball quickly. Referee was happy with it, so they kept doing it. And that's up to the All Blacks to try and fix those sorts of problems. But where it left them was they couldn't they couldn't get that momentum going forward because Ireland's front-up tackling was dominant. The New Zealand's ball carriers are, are, are not carrying the ball the way they should be at the moment. And they just – Ireland just never let them build – any momentum and um to gordon's point about the breakdown work i mean omani jeepers if you could put him in the all black team they would be pretty happy right now because he's actually the player that they're, that they're looking for and they just can't find but he's the guy yeah gordon's dogs agree with that particular point i think gregor uh <laughs> just a couple of more questions uh gregor just to you on, on the the sam kane being taken off moment i know you were writing about this could you just explain to us how, how significant it is for an all blacks captain to be taken off and and is the responsibility on that on the coach or on Sam Kane himself like who looks worse out of that well I I, I think it was uh, the coach looks bad out of uh, out of doing that because like Sam's been under pressure um public pressure like there's been a, a level of unprecedented I don't know if it's unprecedented but it might be animosity towards the Ian Foster coaching regime and Sam Kane has been caught up in that now because he's deemed to be Foster's man. And like he, Sam has always struggled a little bit because he he was the first number seven after Richie McCaw. And who wants to be that guy? You, you're playing in the shadow of McCaw. So he struggled with that. And then Artie Savia came along and he wasn't Artie Savia either. So he's always been um, a difficult player for the New Zealand public to fall in love with because a lot of what he does is unglamorous, but it's what international rugby needs. So he's under a bit of pressure at the moment. There's a lot of people disputing whether he's the right guy to captain the team. And uh, as we talked about last week, Peter O'Mahony made a pretty choice comment about him in the test match and everyone picked up on that. And uh, for, for for him to come off when, with the game was still in the balance, because, you know, as Gordon said, New Zealand can still, even though they weren't going to, they still can score two tries in seven minutes and, and turn a game around really quickly. So 15 minutes to go, 10 points down, you'd still say New Zealand can win that, but you take your captain off. And it's just telling the world there and then that you've lost a wee bit of faith in him. And all these people that have been critical of him are now wondering whether F- Foster is also feeling the same thing, that Sam's not the right player for this team. And look, I don't know whether he is or whether he isn't, but he should have probably played out the game. And if they want to make a change of captaincy, and if they don't want to pick Sam anymore... I think they probably need to do that behind closed doors and communicate that to him, you know, after the test match and make a change if they're going to. But but don't make it 15 minutes before the end of the game because it, it sent out a, a pretty big message about disunity. And I know that Sam was pretty upset by what happened and he looked fairly angry about it. And I know the players were too. So hasn't really helped Foster's position much by doing that. Cool. Go for it. Sorry, Gordon, I was going to say, ahead of a summer tour, there's always a, a dual focus of, firstly, winning the tour, but also, you know, learning and experimenting about with different players. Th- there was no great experimentation the way the series went. In terms of what Andy Farrell learned to what he gained, like, is is it James Ryan, the rejuvenation of James Ryan, the 
Tyke Byrne nailed on now as a, as a world class player. Peter O'Mahony back to his very best. What what are the main things in terms of players he'll have he'll have taken away from the three tests? Oh, yeah. No, I think uh, as he, I think it's as he said there was very little experimentation with it. It was our strongest team, three tests in a in a in a row. Um. You know, you would have said you would have thought Ty Byrne would have been the nailed on starter when he came back from the Lions. Um, but you know, life that's not how it how it has, has panned out for, for him. But like I think he Ty just reinforces how, how important he is in the in the modern game. That type of uh, whether he's a second row or a six, but that ability to get in and over the ball a ball and that type of league play, he's he is really important to how Ireland play, and Ireland look a little bit of a different team with him in it. Um, I think there's an awful lot to like. There was no exper- experimentation, even with the squad going. We knew that there was going to be much uh, much tinkering with, uh, with with this team. That's fine. Um, I think what they've done now is they've created a bit of history, um, and now they have to start planning for. Um, for the future, there's still a little. We're very lucky with injuries in this tour, which is unusual. A raft at the start, but um, we didn't uh, lose too many bodies in the in the in the rest of the in the rest of the game. So, um, I think you will start having to look at uh, what's happening in behind that. And I think you get a, you get what Ireland have now is they've got a free run in the November series. I think to tinker and to have a look at um, ahead of the ahead of the Six Nations. And that's probably as far as we can you can look with this group that there'll be a couple of players, you know, where's Kieran Frawley going to play? I think it's going to be really important. Is he going to be a 10? Is he going to be a 12? Um, because uh, that is, you know, while Johnny Sexton was so important to be playing 70 plus minutes, um, he turned 37 uh, during the tour. So we do need to find a a a like for like replacement. Um, and I don't think Joey has done that in the opportunities he's had. Yeah, that's for sure. That's going to be one of the big questions. Gordon, I can't let you away without asking you about the, the Wexford colours on you this morning. 96 Jubilee yesterday at Croke Park brings back happy memories, I assume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's actually it's actually not a Wexford jersey. It's not a Wexford jersey, right? <laughs> it's it's a it's an homage homage to the, uh, okay. the Wexford uh, jersey. Yeah, uh, it was great. Uh, great some great hurling going on there yesterday. But uh, hopefully our guys will be back uh, back next year. There's plenty going on down there with Darry Egan and, and the coaching team. So we'll give hopefully they'll give it a good a good run next year. Some flashes of uh, really impressive hurling from them this year. So hopefully a bit more consistent next year. Gordon, great to hear from you and the dogs. Thanks a million. Thanks a million. Great Gregor. to see you, man. Thanks a million for everything during the series. We'll chat to you soon. That's uh, Gordon Darcy and Gregor Paul there on the line. I would go along with Donal Kuzak uh, last night that I thought the Jubilee was handled really poorly yesterday and bringing the teams out into a more or less empty Crow Park uh, and some of the greatest teams on the greatest period of hurling there's ever been where there's so many recognisable figures who I think the general public, who the Limerick... And Kilkenny fans would love to have given a proper ovation to it, like that Clare 95, 97 team uh, should have been out in front of 80,000 people. And I went into Crow Park at about, I think it was half two, and I went straight out and was like, is that is that, is that the Wexford team out there already? And there was nobody. There was, you know, I'd say 8,000 people in the stadium and some polite applause. You know, do it at half time. Is there any reason you couldn't do it when the other teams are out doing the warm up? is it too dangerous yeah, yeah. for people to be around but doing it an hour before the game when there's no warm up match so the fact that there's no minor game it sort of changes the entire experience of the it day because yeah. I felt the same last week going into Kerry Dublin uh, and I was going in about 3 o'clock and I've never been around so many people going into Crow Park because obviously the tradition is there's two games so there's a slow trickle of people in from sort of half 12 1 o'clock on but because there's only one game and because of the heat as well I'd imagine people are hanging back and hanging back and they're staying in the pub so you have nobody in the stadium really till 3 o'clock even at quarter past 3 yesterday it felt like the stadium wasn't properly rocking uh, so to bring out the Wexford and Clare teams so early like everyone wants to see Jamesy and Anthony Daly and Davey and these guys and give them the due respect it just just made no sense and they're going to have to look at it for well, I hope for next week, even for for the football, mm. uh, just do it at halftime. Like I mean, and obviously they were kind of it was trickier trying to get everything done. The three teams 
Uh, well, two teams, I guess, mm. technically. But, but exactly. Do, do it at half time and you know, everyone will hang around. Everyone will give them uh, the respect they deserve. OTB AM is brought to you live each morning here by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. So we've uh, done the rugby this morning. You've missed the performance rankings as well. You'll catch them all back on the podcast after the show. After this break, we're going to be live with Tipperary legend Park Maher to reflect on that All-Ireland yesterday. But before that, here's Andy Farrell's response to being asked about the World Cup in the aftermath of Saturday's historic victory. Achievement which has to be celebrated, but at some point over the summer, I go to speak to the players and at these meeting games and say, Let's go, let's go and take another box of next year's World Cup. Yeah, we've got a break. We've got, come on. <laughs> hey, we've, give we've us got, a break. We've got, hey. full, we've got a full season to play. <laughs> we've got a full season to play. Um, you know what I mean? And it, it shouldn't be beat New Zealand and then let's wait for the World Cup. Like, there's plenty more to to play there's big home games in November there's a, there's a six nations to play where we, we still haven't achieved things that we want to achieve in that uh, you know we had a triple crown this year but you know a championship or or better would be something that we're aiming for so there's no reason why we shouldn't be trying to progress and do that and, and think that oh if we it's very Irish to think oh we, we have to take it easy now until the World Cup like we no let's keep making the most of it let's keep getting better and, and uh like that has to be driven by, of course, me as captain and, and the, the, the rest of the leadership group to turn up and show the right attitude in September uh, when we're back playing for our provinces and, and just keep getting better. That's the, that's the key. No, joking aside, you are right. Because that's, that's the biggest thing about the tour, the learnings that we get from it, you know, as a group of um, 70 people, 40 players and 30 staff. Um, to um, to have done what we've done and to make it so hectic and uh, and so difficult, there's there's so many lessons to be learned and that takes a a lot of reflecting over the summer and and used in the right way is, is a powerful thing for us going forward. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Things that put people off on a first date: showing up late and getting your name wrong. Always a great start. Looking at their phone more than you? Eh, uh, hello. Someone who only talks about themselves. Oh, really? God, aren't you great? Look, no one said dating is perfect, but at godating.ie, we promise we'll always try and find your perfect match. Because somewhere out there, there's someone for you. And godating.ie will help you find them. Yes, even you, socks and sandals guy. Go on, go for it with godating.ie. Marginal gains, XG, Top speed? Recovery? What's it all about? Want to improve but don't know where to start? With more data than ever now available, OTB Sports have teamed up with Whoop to cut through the noise and help you raise your game, no matter the sport. OTB Sports are delivering the metrics that matter. Meaningful metrics in partnership with Whoop, the personalized digital fitness and health coach that helps you unlock your inner potential. See Whoop.com for more. Follow OTB Sports social channels for the best insights and stats this season. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. 28 minutes past eight here with us here on OTB AM. It's Owen and Nathan with you right the way through until 10 o'clock this morning. We're going to hopefully go to the Limerick Team Hotel in just a while to hear from people involved in that great win yesterday. We'll hear from Tommy Welch as well before the morning is out. But right now we're joined by uh, Tipperary's le- Tipperary legend, Paddy Maher. Paddy, how are you getting on? Good, lads, yourselves? Yeah, very well. Um, first of all, we were chatting earlier on about Kilkenny and how much more they could have done yesterday to stop that Limerick onslaught. Was there more they could have done to, to try and get a bit closer? Um, yeah, I suppose they probably weren't uh, overly happy on their first half performance, you could say. Um, you know, there was a few of us there together watching the game yesterday up there and we were just saying at half time that they would have been very happy going in with just being four points down, you know. Um, you know, could have got away from very easy in the first half there. They could have easily been seven, eight points down, you know. So, um, yeah, look, looking back over the game as a whole, um, in the grand scheme of things, you should probably say, and if they got a bit of a handle more in, their, in the Limerick half forward line, they might have made it a bit easier for themselves. But um, but look, you know, specific, specific, specifically the Limerick half forward line were all on fire yesterday and they were very hard played at the top of their game. But um, yeah, that probably was one area maybe they could look back on with, with, with a small bit of uh, regret um, that they did, probably didn't win that battle a bit more than, than, they, than they could have. That was always the 
uh, I guess the, the realisation was that after Groot Hegarty had one of his most off days in the semi-final that he would just roar into things in the final and that's exactly what happened yesterday and that entire half forward line killed Kilkenny so what was Kilkenny's plan to try and nullify Groot Hegarty and, and why didn't it work as much the obvious answer to that is that Groot Hegarty is pretty good at hurling yeah no look he was you could see it was plain to see for everyone yesterday he was the top of his game you know everything was just falling for him yesterday you know the runs he was making he was just getting into the ball you know I turned to the brother there at one stage yesterday said the ball is just following him around the pitch um, but that doesn't come by accident the likes of him you know he's that takes a lot of hard work and a lot of effort you know but um, yeah look starting off it looked like to me I had a good view from it in, in, in the stand that they were um, they were trying to hold their line in the half back line a bit for, for um, you know, especially on set plays and puck outs. And they were just, Limerick were getting way too much space. And then when they, when they would go man for man, they were just even, you know, they were still getting away from the Kenny lads. And, you know, they weren't necessarily man marking um, their half forward line as such until they had Paddy Deegan eventually to follow Grode Hegarty. But again, he was just in such uh, top class form, you know, he was absolutely outstanding. And, you know, you'd feel sorry for Paddy, Paddy Deegan too in a way that, you know, you could see he was just giving it everything he had. And that's the kind of player he is. You know, he was all heart, all determination, you know, trying to fight back at every opportunity he could. You know, he he clipped over one or two points himself, but Rod Hegarty responded then again. And, you know, they just had a great battle, you know, but unfortunately for Paddy Deegan and the rest of the Kenny halfbacks, Rod Hegarty was just in a different planet yesterday. You were pretty much right in line, I think, with Rod Hegarty's goal. Uh, how difficult a finish was that? Oh, it was unbelievable. First, we we thought first that maybe one Owen Murphy could have, um, you know, maybe maybe saved it. But then we watched the replays and we just thought oh, there was no hope. It was just an unbelievable finish. Um, you know, even his touch in the rock to bring the ball up. You know, people mightn't have seen that because it happened so quick. But he just flicked it, decided to hurley up into his hand, going at full speed. You know, and you know people say then there was three or four or five Kenny lads around him how did he get away and how did he get the shot off but he was so strong and he's so big and you know his stride is so deceiving like you know so um you know and the strike then again it was just an unbelievable goal and you know as he said in his interview getting out of the match last night you know it kind of set him up for the day and by god did it is it possible to nullify that entire Limerick forward unit because it seemed like Kilkenny did a pretty good job on that Limerick full forward line but to do a good job on the full forward line, do you then leave the half forward line free? Is it essentially you have to pick one or the other and just hope that one of those lines doesn't destroy you if they're left that little bit freer? Yeah, it's very difficult. Like, I suppose you, you go back to the most refined, Claire went a lot man for man and just everyone tries to beat their own man and hopefully everyone else will do the same job. And like, as you said there, like the Kenny full back line yesterday, I thought were outstanding, you know, the obviously Aaron Galan I think got three from play Seamus Fanning got two from play but like as a whole the full back line were, I thought were, were brilliant throughout even when they came on the cost there as well at different stages but again the half forward and then were given so much like this amount of space I don't think I watched the back of the telly last night I don't think watching it telly gives us you know people won't understand how much room and space was around the Limerick half forward line midfield area for them to run into and that's the danger when you're going man for man you know, the team does open up very easily and when you have such good team and players like Limerick and are so well coached in their runs, in their movements, it's very hard, it's very difficult for it to defend. Um, and it just, it, it takes a lot out of the team. Say, for instance, it was Kilkenny yesterday to do that. And uh, I said, Limerick, oh, you need a couple of yards in you. And yesterday they got too many of them around that middle third and, you know, they punished them. Uh, 113 from the half forward line is outstanding and they've been doing that for the last number of years and, you know, that's that's their, their half back line, their half forward line are the two lines that drive that team on and they were t- they, they drove them on again yesterday. Mm. And like I mean, having Dimmer Burns in that half back line is is it something of a of a cheat code and that one from his, his own twenty one was it in the first half is absolutely extraordinary. Just like something you said in the, in your first answer there, Paul, it was just about Kilkenny maybe not getting ball in their half forward line. It, it did feel that their strategy was to get the ball down on TJ Reid early and often, and you can't really fault that tactic because TJ Reid uh, is amazing. So was there a bit more nuance that they were maybe missing at times in that second half, maybe in the first half as well, but especially in that second half when a couple of the wides were starting to clock up for them? Yeah, you know, like you could see they were struggling and the puck out in the first half to Kenny. They were kind of a bit divided of options in, in that when they went short, 
they ended up kind of, if they didn't work it into trouble, you know, I remember Mikey Butler got caught with one, he hit a ball into trouble in the middle of the field from a shot puck out, but they were going along and they only had the one man really to aim for, which was TJ. And in fairness, I know he didn't score from play yesterday, but he was absolutely unbelievable. You know, he was either catching the puck out or he was knocking it down to the Kenny man, or if he didn't win it, he was keeping it there, which which what you want a forward to do, not letting the, the Limerick lads come out with the ball. He was just unbelievable. But unfortunately for Kilkenny, he he looked like their only ball winner from the long ball until Walter came in. And then Walter had a great first 15, 20 minutes in the second half. And he was causing a hassle for the Limerick and, and, and the long puck out. Um, but yeah, it just looked like you could see how Limerick were so well coached on their puck out. And Kilkenny didn't have as many ideas or options on theirs. But it also seemed as if Limerick had war games, the scenario of Walter coming on or for them to go uh, route one on top of TJ and maybe TJ and Walter whereby they just had those bodies back and they were constantly circling behind TJ that if he got the ball and turned, there were still going to be two Limerick men between him and the goals. They were not going to give up any goal opportunities to Kilkenny at all. And it, and it is credit to Kilkenny that they managed to eke one out early in the second half. Yeah, you know, that was sheer determination and doggedness, as you call it, that, you know, even when TJ did get the ball, he caught the puck out for one of the goals. He still had a lot of work to do. He had to get around yeah. Sean Finn. There was another Limerick defender, two Limerick defenders there. He lost his hurley. You know, they, they earned everything, like, you know, and as you said there, they done so well to get the two goals they did. And I think TJ had another chance. He could have hit it over the bar to either bring it back a point or level the game. And he actually took it on again. And he, he went into a lot of Limerick bodies and I think it was overturned. But yeah. You know, but that's just the man he is. Like he was, he was, he was thinking goals, and he was so close. He was probably saying, "This is a great opportunity." But again, Limerick just had the bodies back, and that's the way they played it. They covered that goal mount so so quickly, and uh, they're very good around that area and supporting each other. But yeah, look, it is again when you when you only have that one or two players, you know, like Grohl Hegarty, you Limerick can put the ball down. Grohl Hegarty, they can put it down on, on on Tom Morrissey, Kyle Hayes. Yes, they must have won three field of three puck outs as well. Aaron Galland fielded another long ball in. There's so many options they can play it in. Whether it's, I suppose, Kilkenny yesterday struggles um, to get a bit of a foothold in that kind of, in that in them scenarios in the game. Um, specifically until uh, Walter came on, um, you could see that he could be given another option there and give him, give Limerick something more to worry about. I think we've all used that word doggedness this morning around Kilkenny. Like it's incredible that there was only two points between them at the end of the game because everything seemed to come that little bit easier for Limerick throughout their skill level seemed that little bit higher and then it was even a surprise looking at the stats that they had a similar amount of wides because it felt as though Kilkenny had a lot of bad wides whereas uh, Limerick were scoring at will uh, how did Limerick not win this game by an awful lot more? Yeah you know Alan, and I I said the same man at half time I couldn't believe they were only four pints down like you had to be going in saying if I was in the Kilkenny dressing room saying geez lads we we're in this now, like we're 44 down. We haven't, we're not getting a chance to get going here. Limerick are, are moving well. Um, but like it must have been like I suppose it just shows the heart in them Kilkenny lads and they're from coming from their manager Brian Cody that you know every time they got a score yesterday in the first half, even a lot of the second half, you know, it, they had to put so much effort into getting the scores. The next thing Limerick would pick out the ball and they come back straight away within 20, 30 seconds and have a pint come out back over the bar to far end. Like they answered him a lot yesterday, like you know, Limerick did at next like, Kenny brought, and it just came a bit more effortless to Limerick. Um, Kenny had to earn all their scores, I felt way more. And like to say that TJ had no pine from play, right? Fair enough, but like the amount of work he had he done for other players and laying off scores and the punishment he took for his teammates to get into space, like you know, and that's the way it was. And unlike Limerick. They were able to make their runs into space, the runs off the ball, and the ball was, was being laid on from either it was from Nicky Quaid from a puck out or whether the ball has been played into him into space, you know. So um, but yeah, in fairness to Kilkenny, they showed unbelievable heart, you know, and people say, Oh, well, they have you should have that in a game of hurling, you should have that in an all iron final. But they consistently bring it, like, you know, and all their players, no matter they come off the sideline, they got great contribution off the sideline as well. Yesterday, the subs that came in, they all just showed unbelievable heart, determination, and they stuck in there. And like uh Brian Cody had, or Owen Cody had two wides in the second half. I think Adrian Mullen had two wides, which really are wide. You know, if you get if you if you got half of them, like, mm. you know, they could have been right in touch there at the end and you wouldn't know what might have happened. 
Yeah. What do you think? Would I, like it, it does feel maybe with the evidence of the Galway game at hand as well. It does feel that the later in a game you go, Limerick do have the edge because of the substitutions you mentioned there. So maybe if it does go the the, the distance, maybe in a, in a replay or something like that, you'd, you'd still probably back Limerick, would you? Yeah. Now Limerick were getting, you know, Limerick were, I suppose, they were hurling very well. It was a very hot day. Like we were just saying, like Grod Hegarty was was absolutely unbelievable, and we're saying just anyone they have to make a change and. Either they make a change or else he'll run out of steam. He can't keep going the way he was going. And in fairness, Dave Blanchfield, when he came in for Kilkenny, he actually looked a bit more suitable to Mark Hegarty. But um, at the same time, then, you know, David Reedy came on. He was unlucky for a, a pint. You know, I think Hawkeye denied him a pint. Conor O'Neill came on, got an unbelievable score. Conor Wilding came on, got another unbelievable score. So again, like the bench is just coming on again and making a difference. Like, I don't think Peter Casey scored when he came on. Um, you know, so like Limerick just had the players like and to say that they do it all without Keen Lynch then like imagine he was running to the scenario there yesterday for the last twenty minutes if he was fit, like, you know, nightmare stuff for Kilkenny like, but it's just they're blessed to have the players they have at the moment. And you know, as I, I I'm working down in Limerick, I met I met a Limerick man a few weeks ago that's connected to the team and he said we just have that special group of players at the, at the moment and we have to make the most of it, he said to me, and he's right. Yeah, no, that's it's hard to argue against that, and also kind of how terrifying they seem next year with someone like Carl O'Neill being a year older, Keen Lynch being back to full fitness, hopefully at the, the start of next season. So it does kind of beg the question again this year about how do you stop Limerick? Did we see in the semi final and the final the two teams that are best equipped to potentially stop Limerick? Yeah, maybe so. Um, you maybe seen a possible, you know, maybe given a template, maybe how to try and disrupt them anyway, um, maybe take the, the clear game also final as well. Um, but that takes unbelievable energy, you know, teamwork, communication, all are, need to be 100% for the opposition team to even give themselves an opportunity to beat Limerick. And like, you know, as you said there, how do you even, you know, who's going to stop them next year? Like, fair enough, Galway put it up to him semi-final. Kilkenny gave him a great battle yesterday. But Limerick were still probably the better team on both them days and they came out of a hard muster final as well. So they're getting everything thrown at them, you know, and they the answers to everything. And, you know, they're not going to have, at the moment, if they come through all, come, come through the club games, they're going to have a full squad to pick from. As you said there, Cotton O'Neill's getting old, they're more experienced, Conor Boylan, um, a full, fully fit King Lynch and a fully fit and probably hungry, savage King Lynch for next year after what, what he missed out on this year. So... Like it's very daunting for every other other team going into next year that these lads and like they're going to be thinking down the line like Kenny done four in a row they're going to be thinking greatness and they are a great team but they they're going to break, want to break all the records while they can they their their average age is is working with them within the squad you know so none of them lads are going to be going anywhere for a while so um very daunting for every other team and you know for to try and come up with ideas and ways of beating them look some teams maybe give you know. A ways and, and maybe a plan of beating him this year, but it hasn't hasn't worked. So there, there has to be another way. Um, but people aren't able, to, teams aren't able to find it out at the moment. I think it'll be a shock if if Liam Cahill isn't appointed Tipperary manager over the next few weeks. Is a Tipperary with Liam Cahill in tow a possible problem for Limerick next year? Oh God, it's hard to know. And like, yeah, yeah there's strong strong talks down here that he's going to be matinee manager soon enough, and. Uh, Look, if he does, you know, he, he would have had a lot of them tip lads under his wing at minor under 20 and under 21 as well and had was successful with them all. But, you know, senior inter-county is a lot different, you know, and, you know, players obviously, you know, they progress and, you know, they either come on or they don't, it doesn't suit them, you know. And it'll be interesting to see, but I still think tip are doing a lot, are in, in, in the stage of a lot of development at the moment. So... I won't be getting too carried away that they're going to be worrying Limerick next year as of yet. Like as you from watching yesterday, you know, they're a good bit behind at the moment. But look, hopefully we can get the our house in order in the background in tip and then we can see where it takes it takes us. But um yeah, I think a lot of teams a lot of teams have a, a lot of um catching up to do to, to catch Limerick at the moment. Uh, 
opinion is divided on how uh, it was handled over the weekend. Like uh, the Colin Bonner, a lot of people felt maybe hadn't made the impact people wanted, but uh, a lot of people not feeling it wasn't quite right. The language that was used around his departure, uh, relieved of his duties, isn't really a, a GEA term. What have you made of how it's gone over the last couple of weeks? Yeah, you know, look, I suppose look, when you're in the county, you you hear all these different things and I've heard more stories about different what was going on and that you know, to be laughing at half them. But um but yeah look look if 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 the if the tip county board or whoever was involved or the players or look if the thing wasn't meeting the standards or wasn't up to scratch or you know not what was needed, well then obviously you can't stay going for another year or two and everyone being unhappy like because you're not going to make progress and it's not going to it's not going to work basically. And Fair enough. If change had to be made, they had to be made, and now is the time to make them. You can't be waiting around. But like, obviously, it could have been, you know, dealt with a bit better. You know, um, the wording of the statement, obviously, and things like that. That could have been probably sorted a bit more, you know, suitable to everyone in the background. And that's stuff that we're obviously not privy to. But, but yeah, look, it's 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 hard, especially when it's one of your own county men. You know, Colm is 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 a tip man. You know, true and true was a great player for Tipperary. You know, and. Well, it doesn't work out, people are obviously going to be disappointed. But look, we just want to what the, we all want what's the best for Tipperary in the county. And you know, if people aren't happy, if 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 if, 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 if the standards will decisions have to be made, unfortunately. But again, I would have to agree with you that it probably could have been dealt with a bit a bit a bit, a bit easier and, and, and even quieter than the way it was. Uh, it's going to be a, a long winter, party, and we're going to have to spend a lot of time chatting about this Limerick side and their greatness, and we'll no doubt get into. Limerick, Kilkenny, which of them is greater? Which 15 would you split up? Uh, you obviously played both of them, uh, the great Kilkenny side, and you played against this great Limerick side. Uh, which would which would the Tipperary team of 2010 take down easier? Jeez, I don't know. It's hard. It's actually, it's a hard, I'm not trying to dodge it around. It's a hard answer because they're both different teams. Like, you know, you see yesterday the way Limerick go about their business. Fair enough, they're physical, like the, the Kilkenny team. They're physical, they're hard working, but they're like. And t- t- the point I'm trying to get across is, I think they're so well coached, Limerick. Like I know the lads were raving about Paul Connacht last night in the Sunday game, but like you can just see them the way they play. They have so different avenues and options that they they can turn to, even if you do get on top of them. You know, they're able to make decisions on the pitch. Or you as they're able to make decisions quickly in the pitch, or they're getting the messages in off the sideline to the pitch quicker than any other team. But they seem to be able to adapt to any scenario you throw them, you know. So I think they're so well coached, and that comes from so much hard work that the man that the management they have put into them. Like whether it's I think the Kenny team before, obviously they, they had their their way of playing that, but they were made way more kind of man to man, you know, in their positions. I'm good enough to beat you in your position. And that's the way it was. Whereas I think Limerick now, they make you think a lot more. They bring you to a lot of different areas of the pitch, you know, and you have to probably think your way through games more. So, look, it's very difficult to pick which team is better. I think individually still, individually, I think the Kenny team back in the 0-9-10 are probably individually better players. But maybe Limerick, the Limerick team now as a team and the way they play and the connections they have, um, possibly could be a better team. Right. Yeah, well, we'll be having this conversation probably again and again and again over the, the next little while. Uh, Park, great stuff this morning. Thanks, Millie, for being with us. Cheers, lads. Thanks. Cheers. That's uh, Polly Maher there on the line. It is 8.48. OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Here's what we've got coming up on OTB Sports Radio today. From 1 o'clock, OTB Gold is Gooch, the autobiography. From 3 o'clock is Splunk Sport. 4 o'clock is the Classic Game Club on Celtic against Rangers. And then 6 o'clock is OTB Gold with Emmanuel Petit in Dublin. And then 7 o'clock tonight, Off The Ball is live with Joe. You can follow Off The Ball across all our social channels. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to download the OTB Sports app for the latest and best in sports content and analysis. Now, Ashley O'Reilly is at the Limerick Team Hotel. We'll go to her in just a moment. But on Saturday, she was at the All-Ireland semi-finals in football. Uh, Louise Galvin was playing with that Kerry team and she spoke to Ashling alongside a very special guest. Have a look. Louise, congratulations. You're through to an All-Ireland final. And more importantly, you have a little man here in your arms. I do, yeah. He's uh, he's quiet at the moment. But um, yeah, we're absolutely delighted. It's 10 years since we've been in an All-Ireland final. 
Um, and look, this under Dara and Declan, the squad has been building for the last three years. We knew this was within our capabilities. Um, and I think we put on great performance. The girls out there today were phenomenal. And yeah, really look forward now to two weeks. Yeah, what a performance from start to finish. You know, even when Mayo got a, a bright period there in the, the start of that second half, you just never gave up and they kicked on and they kicked some brilliant scores. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think there's multiple threats within this team. Like, we have a lot of girls that are there a long time, like Lorraine Scanlon, Louise Muirherty, Colt Lynch, and they, they're they always fantastic. But we've added so much more, you know, we're so much more of a team than just relying on a few of those girls now as well. Um, and I think some of the scores we kicked out the second half were phenomenal team scores. At the girls at the back as well, like, they were, you know, turning Mayo over. I think it's great that we didn't concede any goals today. Um, Mayo are very good team they're good long wage points kicking and we definitely did let them get on a bit of a run but um i think we always had the threats on the other side as well and enough in the in the defense to to keep them from scoring goals really and probably goals with the difference at the end of the day yeah absolutely and you have your hands full this little man it's amazing to see that you're you're back playing you only had him in march yeah, end of March. So I suppose it wasn't really part of the plan initially because he's a bit late. But um, no, I'm I'm delighted to be back within the squad. Like, and you know, last year was great being back in with them. And if I can contribute, whether on the pitch, off the pitch, I'm just delighted. And we look forward to Co Park again in two weeks. And so, how long of a rest did you have from after having him to get back to the squad? Um, I think I was back in with about nine nine weeks or so. So it's a, it's been a tough few weeks trying to get up to the pace of it because you know championship intensity is is so so quick but um you know looking forward to uh putting the shoulders to the wheel now the next few weeks and your manager declan there was saying that you were feeding him inside there in the dressing room yeah i'm not sure is he the first baby to be a uh, first fit and go for the dressing room, but hopefully he won't be the last you know it's um he's a great little baby and i get great support i have to say from my family from my my husband and from the lads the management and the girls as well to help me out like what i'm sharing there they're holding him um so look this is you know why not if if it's yeah exactly we're just we play it by ear you know he's a priority as well at the end of the day um but so far he's been i think a, a good distraction i think for the girls in the build-up to the game and that and his first time in crow park and he'll be going to an all-ireland final now pretty amazing um actually second time because we came to the men's quarterfinal win over mayo as well um we were lucky enough to get corporate tickets that we were able to take him um so it's, uh, yeah he's been to quite a few grounds at this stage now for a uh, three and a half month old baby but um he'll be back up again in, in two weeks and yeah hopefully we get the win that day brilliant louise and congratulations and best of luck in the final thanks very much yeah, Louise Galvin of Kerry in conversation with Ashley O'Reilly after their win at the weekend in the All-Ireland semi-final. They're going to play Meath now on uh, Sunday week uh, in the decider in that one. Right, I'm delighted to say we can go to the Limerick Team Hotel. Dan Morrissey, an All-Ireland winner once again this year, is on the line. Good morning to you, Dan. How are you holding up? Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, hi, yeah. Um, we had a good night last night. Now, it wasn't, wasn't too late, but um, there's a few of us up in the lobby down this morning getting getting an early breakfast to, to kickstart the day ahead. Name names. Who's up and who who might be the late arrivals? <laughs> William, I don't know who's here beside me. Yeah, Nicky Quaid is floating around there as well. Um, I'd say there'd be a few lads now in bed till, till 11 or 12, I'd say. The, the young lads. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the young lads. So I think the train, we're getting the train back to Limerick there just after lunchtime. So there'll be a few tired heads, but uh, we'll definitely enjoy the next few days. Where, where did he go last night? Uh, we just stayed here in the Burlington Hotel. Uh, we didn't venture into coffers or anything like that now last night. Um, it was obviously now great to meet the fans and all that because the last two years there wasn't anything. Um, obviously 2020, it was literally we got the train back after the match. And everyone back, went back to their own house. There was nothing we could do at all. Last year, there was, uh, in fairness, there was a nice function back in Limerick. But I suppose, yeah, this year really uh, reminds us of 2018 again. Everything kind of back to normality. Uh, the place was packed here last night. Sure, it was, uh, it was a, great, a great evening. Cause I was just about to say, like, it really felt in the stadium yesterday as if it was right on a par with 2018. That unbelievable outpouring of emotion, having not won an All-Ireland since 1973 in 18. It kind of felt like there was another drought almost going into yesterday because of uh, the COVID years that, that you had to go through. It was incredible, I'd imagine, being a part of it. Oh, it was. Sure. Everything about today, uh, I suppose the weather, how good the game was and how close it was. Um, not knowing who was going to win really till the referee blew the final whistle and then just seeing the green and white of Limerick supporters there like the the amount of Limerick supporters there yesterday was was phenomenal um, 
and the way, yeah, the championship panned out this year, like seven games, we really had to earn every single game we played. Um, so, yeah, it definitely was just the sweetest 2018. Um, and, yeah, as you mentioned, the last two years, while they were great, I know last year was half attendance and obviously no attendance at all for 2020. Yeah, this one was just special to see everyone back. And it means so much to the people at Limerick. So uh, I'm sure there'll be a big crowd out to, to welcome us home later on this evening. How tough was it, Dan, the game yesterday? Because we've just been talking with Paulie Marmer saying, like, Limerick played so well, it felt like you would have beaten any other team by maybe 8-10 points. It, it, you have to check yourself, there was only two in it at the end. Like, Kilkenny just wouldn't go away. Yeah, that's typical Kilkenny. We, they're, they're never beaten until the final whistle goes. Um, yeah, any time. I, th- I think we did respond to when, when they got the goals. We kind of got our couple of points, so we didn't really let them get a, get a lead at all. But... Uh, it was a, f- a fierce physical game, uh, no inches given, and that's that's what you expect when you play Kilkenny. Uh, we probably haven't played them as much over the last five years as we would have, say, obviously the other Munster teams. And uh, but yeah, it was uh, it was a tough game, and uh, just really delighted to, to come out on the right side of it. Do you get better at appreciating these moments as the years go by? I presume the first couple are a bit of a a bit of a flash, and the moments go by so quickly. Are you better at soaking it all in now? Yeah, I think so. Like, yeah, sure. 2018 was just so new to everyone. Uh, the build up, the, the week after the game, uh, it just went so quick. Whereas, I suppose, yeah, you do become more appreciative of it to really make, to make the most of these days. And you just can't take them for granted. Like, please God, we have another a few All Ireland's in us, but you, you really just have to, have to enjoy these days while they're here. And uh, look, you, you never know what's going to happen down the line. Please God, we'll, we'll be around for another few years. But. You, you have to enjoy these days. For, for Limerick supporters, we went through a, a long enough time. We're never going to Crow Park. Um, so to be, to be coming to Crow Park on nearly an annual basis for the last few years and, and winning All-Ireland titles, it, it's so new to, to every Limerick person. So we'll definitely enjoy it and, and make the most of these few days. Can I ask you, Dan, just about the, the sense of history that is attached to, to yesterday's All-Ireland? Like as, as somebody from the Ahan Club, I'm sure you would have grown up on stories of the legend that is Mick Mackey and his three All-Ireland titles. Getting to four All-Ireland titles, officially getting one past Mackey, I presume given your own hurling heritage, that's just an incredible thing to think about this morning. Yeah, it is when you put it like that. Um, and to be honest, like before the game, there was no real talk of three in a row between in our group. It was all just, this is another All-Ireland final. Um, and that's the way we like to kind of approach games. Don't put any extra pressure on us. It's we try to approach the first game of a Munster championship the same as as we did the match yesterday. But um, yeah, to, I suppose sit back and reflect on it now to, to have four All Irelands in in five years. It is it is a special achievement. And yeah, obviously that great Limerick team of the Turkeys with Mick Mackey. I would have heard an, heard a lot of stories about about that team growing up. And uh, I suppose to re, to replicate and win and, and win four All Irelands. Uh, Ah, it's just incredible. Like I suppose when I first joined the Limerick panel, to to dream of winning one All Ireland would have would have been an amazing achievement, or an amazing dream I would have had. But to win four, I don't think many of us would have uh, would have thought we would have been in this position going back say, to the start of 2018. What what sort of reception will yourself and Tom get in Castle Connell then? Because I was down there before the All Ireland last year. It's a place that is absolutely obsessed with hurling, to say the very least. They were just so unbelievably proud of you, and in a level just that's not the same as their historic greats as well. I presume it's just an incredible experience going back down to, to Castle Connell specifically. Ah, it is. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I suppose the hand is. It's known throughout the country. I suppose Mick Mackey helped put put us on the map and. Uh, yeah, they're really proud hurling people down there, down in Castle Connell. Well, we have uh, temporarily oh, lost our connection to uh, to the team hotel. We'll get back there in just a moment. And we'll get a couple of other voices as well on the line, hopefully, uh, over the next few minutes. So that's uh, Dan Morrissey having a... Up like at eight fifty eight this morning. Twenty nine. Dan Morrissey is. Uh, I think once you know, once you get past 25, 26 on, as you're discovering, you know, early nights, the key. Take it all in. Yeah. Is that, is that the truth, Dan? Once you get to the age of 29, this, uh, things just start to get that little bit tougher in celebrations? We do not actually have Dan. He's, uh, he's the, gone again. The, the, team, the, the team hotel and RTE going to the team hotel is one of the great moments of Irish TV every year. They were at the Burlington last night and uh, Groot Hegarty's up getting his man of the match from Marty and from Larry McCarthy. And in the background, the wedding is continuing. Doesn't matter a hell if we're live on TV. They are serving the dessert no matter what. 
it was quite. So it, it looked quite tasty as well. The dessert, no expense spared, I'd imagine, for the All Ireland champions. Yeah. Uh, and the waiter is getting a bit of a telling off from one of the managers. The one, you know, get it. There's lads over there still waiting on their dessert. There's a, some guy holding a sign. There was three people at one table still waiting on their dessert. It's just full flow. What What was for dessert, Dan? Uh, it was kind of a mixture of kind of some sort of an ice cream. Now I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> it was nice anyway. I ate it. <laughs> Uh, Dan, one of the great things yesterday was to see Keane Lynch up lifting the trophy with Declan Hannan and he's such a big personality of that Limerick squad. Can you talk us through the last week from from training when he picks up the injury and, and his role over the last week? Yeah, like we played a bit of a match amongst ourselves last Sunday morning and uh, yeah, Keane obviously got a bad knock in his ankle and uh, I suppose we kind of knew coming off that pitch that, uh, judging by the size of his ankle, he wasn't going to be playing, playing this weekend. And uh, I wouldn't mind, but he'd be fine at training all all week. Um, so look, John's always been been saying to us, it's always next man up. We've we've lost, over the years we've lost a lot of lads through injuries, suspensions, different things, and it's always next man up. And that's the strength of the panel that you need. Um, so look, everyone was bitterly disappointed for Keane and, and for the team because look, he's obviously a, a huge loss to us. But at the same time, we had faith in our panel and we knew whoever was whoever was going to be vain was going to be able to do the job. Um, so yeah, it, look, it was obviously very disappointing for Keane, but he didn't leave that disappointment to overshadow the whole thing. He was back at training on Tuesday night with a smile on his face and uh, as if nothing had happened at all. And uh, he's just great to even be around. He's obviously had his injury troubles this year, but. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's just a great bond within the whole squad. Yeah, that's something that has been mentioned quite a bit, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But just uh, quickly again, on, on last weekend, on the the injury to, to Keane, like, it sounds like he was good to start or was going to at least be in contention to start before that injury. So, like, I mean, he is a talismanic player as much as one can be a talismanic player in your, in your squad. When that moment happens, is, is there a couple of groans are you thinking, geez, this is not ideal a week out from an All-Ireland? Yeah, there is. Part of your look, part of your head will will always think like that. We we saw him go down, and it was in the middle of the game. We had to kind of take a five minute break while while he kind of got uh, lifted off the field. But uh, right. yeah, just part of, I suppose part of you would be could think it'd be like, oh, this is not ideal preparation for an All Ireland final. But I suppose we've been in situations where we've lost lads down through the years. We've had a lot of cruciate injuries, different injuries, and. We've always just had faith in whoever was the 15 lads on the field and whoever's going to come off the bench were, uh, were going to be able for the job. So, uh, yeah, look, it's never ideal to lose one of your key players the week before an All-Ireland final. But um, at the same time, it didn't, it didn't overly worry. Yeah, plenty of people trying to get on the hotel Wi-Fi this morning. Live TV. Down All the boys breakfast. are just waking up. I was just going to ask, I wonder who injured Keane Lynch or did he just go over on his ankle, I wonder. When, when I mean, we get him back. It's the, the bit, the That's bit the I story. want to find out. That's the story. Well, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't matter anymore. I mean, that is uh, pretty remarkable. To, to, like, I mean, the, the early signs were that even like before the semi-final that he could have come on and actually started that game. So I think everybody was thinking a week ago, you know, he's definitely going to start this game. And then when the rumours start to circulate earlier this week, you're like, oh God, this could be... Uh, it's going to be a bit some, something close to a fatal blow, but... Well, I think, again, okay you mentioned it. the strength of the squad. Like, it shows the strength of the squad that even though Keane Lynch, as you say, is seen as something of a talisman, that nobody could quite figure out who he'd come in and replace yeah. and where he'd fit back into the side. Dan, I was just going to ask you there, who who actually... Oh, no, 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 no. We are not going to do that. We keep thinking we have him and then we don't have him. That's okay. He's, uh, Dear God. Are we keeping him from his breakfast, I wonder? Like, the hotel breakfast is obviously the key part of all this. That's a bit early for breakfast yet now, because these lads are going to be on the go all day, aren't they? Early for breakfast. It's nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> if you've been out late, William O'Donoghue, have you had your breakfast? What's the crack? I haven't. I have a cup of tea, and that'll do me. Grand. Well, we let we... after this. No. <laughs> we let you get to it very shortly. Oh. How are you feeling? All right. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, like probably, obviously, still hasn't set in yet, and all that kind of stuff. But it's uh, huge, huge feelings of satisfaction and elation, basically, just to see the, you know, see your family and have a night like last night. Um, be mingling with supporters again and you know that's kind of I suppose the overriding feeling is just you know seeing what it means to people again and stuff like that Is there a sense of just trying to capture it all in those moments trying to to appreciate that moment with the family in a way that maybe you couldn't get to do over the last couple of years that the celebrations were almost something that you were looking forward to and planning almost for, for a while now given you didn't get to do it in 20 or 21 um, well, unfortunately, as a player, like you can't really yeah. think about that. You know what I mean? Like it's it's not something that you can have in your mind, or you know, you 
if you don't go and do your job and look after what you're meant to do, there'll be, you know, there'll be no celebrations. Um, but I suppose just even just small stuff like seeing Declan, um, Declan lifting the cup again to uh, a sea of green, you know, not even as a player, but as a Limerick person, it's just incredible to see and to see the amount of kids who, who got to be there again yesterday and witness that and who are growing up, obviously, during a special time. It's just in- incredible what it means to everyone from Limerick, not just us as players. Uh, Groot was saying in his interview after the match yesterday just how much you all love playing in Croke Park and the Limerick fans absolutely love that place as well. It felt like a home stadium, a home match for Limerick there yesterday. Just what is that like in the middle of it all when you hear the big Limerick roars for every score that's going between the posts? Oh, it's incredible. Like, you know... Um, like it, it can give you such a lift and obviously when when you're against an opposition team and stuff like that is happening and that roar you know the, when you're on the other side of it you know it, it can deflate you that small bit so to have who, who I would consider the best the best supporters in in the game is is obviously a huge benefit to us and it's a uh, it's something we're very proud to be a part of you know that we give those those people that those days and those moments how different was last night compared to 2018 where 2018 was the end of the famine there was such a wait and nobody really knew what to expect from this Limerick side whereas now there's nothing but expectation on this Limerick side that you will go and deliver on the biggest stage does it change the winning feeling? Um, I don't I don't think so because as players you obviously and that is the uh, end of that particular segment uh, once again we'll keep going back ask the, over ask the big questions first is what I'm thinking that's it just get, get one in at the start and uh, we'll get back to, to Will in just a moment at the team hotel the, um, these lads are looking very fresh Nathan they, well, these, it's almost as if they're yeah. finally primed athletes or something but, uh, exactly they're, these, they won't say it but these boys are thinking about four in a row yeah, yeah. Oh. Was, uh, there you go Nathan <laughs> oh, that, that it will say it <laughs> They, they won't admit it on air, but about yeah. three o'clock this morning, definitely it came up. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. People will be saying like, oh, next year's the one. I'm like, it's literally still the same day. <laughs> like we won, like we won like six hours ago. Like, can you just give it a rest? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember we got it. I remember getting it in the woodlands last year as well. Be like, oh, next year's the big one. And I was just looking at him like, you know, I was still sweating from the match. Like, please, like, please, like will you give me a break. <laughs> Who's saying that sort of stuff? Is is it Limerick fans mostly? Is it is it family members? Oh, it's or friends? Yeah. No, it's uh, I think family members are well warned and well versed on what they can and what, what they can and can't say. Um, it's fans, but I mean, they're they're saying it from a good place. It's just pure joy. It's pure excitement, and uh, you know, it's just it's incredible to have that kind of pressure. You know, it's it's a good thing that that people are are willing that and wanting that because it shows we're in a good place. Uh, was John Kiley singing last night? Um, yeah, the the mic dropped on the RT and the during the live thing, and he started he started. Uh, did to reset and he gave us a verse or two of, of Piano Men but he uh, he left it at that so I'm sure he'll he was saving himself for today for the homecoming I'd say. Yeah. It, it is Piano Man right? It's like Piano Man every year it and is, that's yeah. it it's, it's one and done from Kylie right? I know he's no? he has a few in the locker yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What else? Yeah. But Piano Man is the main one Piano Man is like his would be the last tune on the set now he dropped the mic to Piano Man it's a, Okay. What about you? No. No. No, it just don't. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> Can you just, talk about about happen. Kylie and uh, and what he's done, what he's done for you, I guess, and what he's done for all this team and the standards he'd set that you know you have been able to set this relentless pace over the last few years. Yeah, I mean, I, I, John John is an incredible man, but I think uh, he's no more incredible than the people he's surrounded himself with. You know, he's from everyone to from his management to uh, you know our liaison officers, uh, Joe O'Connell, Conor McCarthy. Ever OD, you know, like John's John's strength is surround himself with, you know, people who have the same vision as himself, people who are as committed to the you know, to Limerick GA as he is. And I think when you've that many people all pulling in the right direction, you know, good things are you you know, you've a chance of good things happening. And uh, you know, John John's an incredible man. He you know, he, when he took over in twenty seventeen, if someone had told had told you guys there at the end of that year that we'd win four out of the next five, I don't think anyone would believe him and, and probably rightly so. You know, there there was no grounds to go off that that would be the case. And he's managed to deliver that for Limerick and he does it with huge humility and huge pride in Limerick GA and um it's just, you know, it's I'm very, very proud to let's say to be involved with him and, and everyone else at the at the minute. Was there a moment in late 17, early 18, when you realised that there was something a bit different about Kylie, that this was potentially going to lead to something very, very special? Um, no, I don't think there was any one moment. I think 
just the way he tried to implement um, everything he was trying to implement was positive. You know what I mean? There was no one light bulb moment or anything like that. Everything he did was made sense, was fair to players, the way he engaged with us, the way he mentored us, the way he tried to mould us into being the best people that we could be. Um, you know, everything. It was just all encapsulating the way he, he went about it. And uh, it was just a, a setup that you wanted to be a part of and a setup that, you know, you wanted to go train and you wanted to be around the group and you, you know, you wanted to give it your all. And Dan touched on that a few moments ago as well. And it's been something that's been remarked upon by a lot of your teammates as well over the last few years. The sense that you just love spending time with one another. That like you just love the experience of being in this group. And that's kind of important when you're spending that amount of time with each other. Yeah, it is. I mean, like this week, uh, you know, I was buzzing to go train and buzzing go, to go to the gym this week because, you know, it'll be long enough now that we won't be together. And, you know, during a week where there's obviously a lot of build up and hype and stuff like that, just to be around the lads is, is very calming and it's it's a special place to be. And, um, you know, I, I think what helps is like that we all get on. There's no there's no egos. There's no no one person going off on a solo doing their own thing. And uh, that obviously helps build a bond and a connection because everyone is everyone is putting in the same amount and everyone's getting the same amount out. How does that happen? Like, how, how do you get to that point where uh, a, a bunch of very, very talented young hurlers don't actually manage to... Not one of them seems to develop an ego or seems to, to step out of line at all. Like, how, how does that happen over the last few years? Uh, I think it's because, you know, we're not very good hurlers. You know, that's not what we're about. We're about working for another. We're about trying to be good people, trying to be, you know, uh, trying to be humble, trying to, you know, understand that this is a lot bigger than just us. And, um, you know... You know, first and foremost, we're not just good hurlers. You know, it's not. It's not about the hurling side of it. We'll get back uh, to that in just a moment. That's uh, William O'Donoghue there on the line, Limerick midfielder, and uh, about everything else, and just good. Sorry, well, just right, dropped, you drop dropped you there for a sec. We'll just leave you leave you with uh, one last question, maybe just on on the game yesterday was pretty incredible to watch. The score taking was was extraordinary across both halves of, of that match. Yeah. What's it like being in the middle of all of it? I, I presume a little bit chaotic and you're not fully aware of, of just what a spectacle it is. Yeah, it is, yeah. Um, like, I mean, you never really... When you're playing, like, when they get goals and stuff, like, if you're a Limerick supporter, it's probably a lot more deflating. But when you're playing, you just have to kind of get out, reset, and, you know, you very much have to just focus on the next puck out. So a lot of it kind of just flies over your head or you don't realise how biggest score um, you know some of the points that Tom McCoy got after their goals yesterday because you're, you're probably already turning around or trying to be where you need to be but um, it'll, you know it's as a player I suppose that's the issue you don't you don't get to savour all those moments but I'm, I'm sure we'll watch it back today and uh, have, have good crack while doing so four in a row four in a row come on tell us about it <laughs> I, have no idea. I have no idea um, I have no idea I have no idea hopefully we'll just have a good week and, I'd uh, say you will somehow do you, get, get what's the crack with a dare manor? Do you get run of the place at a dare manor? Do you no, get is, is there free golf? The the place. No, there's no free. You, have you been talking to Garode Hegarty? Well, this is, I, I was uh, I ended up following uh, Tiger with Garode for a few holes, uh, and I was uh, oh, yeah. I was wondering who are the non golfers on the Limerick team that might have a few passes to give up for you know. No, no, lads. trust me, there's no golf there. No, we're. Uh, Right. No, no, we, you couldn't leave us. You couldn't leave us out in, out in that course. No, <laughs> I, I, I saw you down there actually at at their manor last week. Did you get into the? Yeah. Did you get inside the ropes as well with Tiger, or was that just Garod? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Oh, you no, did. No. Was that just Garod? He will love that. No. <laughs> <laughs> was that just Garod? I was. Uh, yeah, Garod's probably playing with Tiger this week now after his performance. <laughs> after his performance, and he also owns the Lee McCarthy as well. He didn't give it to anyone else. Already oh, was he that. sleeping with the Lee McCarthy? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no one else. That's the Grove Hegarty Cup. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, real. Uh, congratulations. We're going to leave you on the line there to, to hopefully speak to another one of your teammates. But enjoy the celebrations. There's no one here, but <laughs> oh, knocking just, some doors. So yeah, come on. Just, we, we leave. Just, just so we don't, just so we don't leave it too long. Cheers, guys. Thanks. All right, fair play. Enjoy it. Uh, William O'Donoghue there on the line. Uh, we'll hopefully get one of his other teammates there in just a moment to speak to. OTB AM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. We're going to take a break, I think, and uh, we're going to have Shane Masicki with us uh, in just a moment. Back in a few. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? If you had to pick a greatest British footballer of all time, or even since Bobby Charlton, would you go along the, the Gareth Bale lines or uh, have another pick? Uh, I think Kenny Dalglish would be pretty upset by that. If you want to say, is he the greatest since Dalglish? Oh, there's an argument for it. 
won what three European Cups with him. His his link up with Russia's, but I mean Russia's got an argument there as well. I mean Russia was, was a. I think we we don't realise now how good Russia was. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts, and download the OTB Sports app. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. 14 minutes past nine, you're welcome back to OTBAM. Seamus Hickey has been listening in to some of his former teammates there, doing a pretty good job, I would say, Seamus, of getting up early and uh, and doing their media duties. Yeah, if, if, if they're not polished at this stage, uh, <laughs> I don't really know if there's much hope for the rest of us. Um, but Will is especially good. Uh, Dan, the same, always well-spoken, but Will... Will's Will always got a great head and shoulders and uh, on and off the field. Like, top man. Like, it's great having the lads with great heads on their shoulders. We want the lunatics on this morning. <laughs> who, who should we, whose door should we be knocking on? Oh, gee, a lot of them have left. Tom Condon is retired. Uh, so, uh, I know, in fairness, the, I think, I think John Kiley has the, the lunatics uh, well sheltered, I think. So, I think <laughs> that's part of the what the, What is the Monday morning like after winning in All-Ireland? Um, yeah, no, the, the, the hotel the following morning is, is, is pretty cool. Uh, it's weird um, because you've got the mingle of the the supporters are staying staying in the hotel. Uh, you're coming down having breakfast. You're talking to the guy from Temple Glanton in West Limerick about how he travelled up with his daughter and that uh, uh, this is the best day of her life, his life, uh, everybody around him. And like that's that's the nature of it. Um, you know, like you know, it's it's true what the boys are saying like the, the 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 best part of it is the sharing of the win the sharing of the win with the people around you the sharing of the win with your teammates the the, the really tight knit group that they have um that's the best part because you you're you're working so hard from uh day to day recovery sessions gym sessions focus is always on getting the most out of your next uh, your next 90 minutes your next 60 minutes your next 15 minutes whatever you get uh, so it's uh, it's it's great to actually reach the end of it uh, and, and to actually just to, to revel in it Is yesterday potentially even sweeter for these lads than 18 was? Uh, it's hard to know so it's, it's funny it's always the old adage so the, the first one is the first one is so sweet and it's so it's so joyous a lot of the other ones, especially the defence of, of of a title, is 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 almost relief afterwards. Um, like even even like so, the, the game was so tight yesterday. Um, you know when Blanchfield got the point uh, at the end of the game, when Walsh got the point at the end of, to to draw close to within a score, and a two point lead in hurling is an awful awful lead to have. So you know it's 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 tense, it's nervous, and then at the final whistle, it's just relief uh, and. Uh, so there's there's a there's a fair mix of that, and whether which is the dominating one, which is the dominating emotion, I don't know. Uh, depends on depends on uh, on your your journey and your story during the year. Mm. The the kind of the, the aftermath just felt very similar to, to eighteen yesterday. I guess maybe we just haven't seen it for a while over the last few years for for obvious reasons. Just like on, on an analytical level, like I mean, I'm not sure how much you're talking to the players in camp, Seamus, or even just from what you're seeing from watching the games. Has there been much of a development in terms of how they're approaching hurling at the moment under Kylie and Canark? Uh, so I would argue, I would argue that so the, the the game plan is the game plan. Um, and, and has been since seventeen. Um, the I would argue that you know twenty twenty and twenty twenty one were were almost perfection in the execution of it. Um, the reality is now Limerick are the most studied team in the country um, for the last number of years. Uh, everything that is done, whether it was in, early in the league this year, was to stop their dominance on puckouts, was to uh, try and stifle the middle where. You don't want that Limerick half forward line going off. Now, yesterday was probably it was the difference for us, uh, only for the performance of of our three in the half forward line. You know that that result isn't happening. Uh, so everything is done to try and stifle and stimmy that that Limerick team. Uh, so you know when you see every test that was given to them this year was was everything. Every so I would argue that was probably Kilkenny's best performance of the year. Um, that was Galway's best performance of the year in the semi. Clare peaked twice and still couldn't beat Limerick and that was soul destroying in in the Munster final and it was you know mentally affecting uh, as you could see from their from their following games so um 
you know, Limerick have gotten everything this year. And I would I would argue that, you know, the tide is rising around them. Uh, that Kilkenny team is better than it was in 2019. And that Galway team is better than it was last year. You know, so, and that Clare team this year, really, Brian Lohan had, did an exceptional job in getting the best out of them in the Munster. Um, that was, it was a pity how it unraveled from in the in the All-Ireland series. But it was, Limerick got everybody's best shot. Um, and so when you're talking about did they develop over the last few years, um, I I don't know. Well, I I don't know if if develop is the right word, but they have constantly been honing what they're good at. Um, and I suppose if that's if that's if that's development, it's getting better at what you're already good at. Then you know they've been doing that. Seamus, they've players built for the big occasion as well, and none more so than Grow at Hegarty. And last year's final performance was exceptional. Yesterday was arguably even better in a much tighter game. He was quiet in the semi final. I don't think anyone doubted coming into this he was going to produce something, but from the quality of the goal early on, his ability to find space constantly to just play the game at his own pace. How have you seen him develop over the last few years? It's so. Okay. Garod, Garod is, is and, and a lot of people will be able to talk about Garod, but like when he came off footballers, um, when he was part of that All Ireland under 21 team um, back in 2016, uh, it was, you know, he, he, was, he was raw. He had that incredible athleticism where he was running from one side of the field to the other, and you were wondering, where are you going? Uh, why, are you, why are you running 60 metres? Uh, you know, we, we don't play with a big ball here. But it was, it, it, you know, he stuck to what he what he was good at and what he had developed in the football field, and brought into her that incredible athleticism where keeping up with him is just an, an absolute nightmare. And then when the ball arrives, you have to grow an extra foot and a half to try and compete with him. Uh, so he managed to marry all that. And then if if anybody saw the hours that he spent working on his striking and his shooting, because anybody was anybody can tell you back in seventeen and eighteen. Um, he wasn't a consistent striker, and you were a striker when when you had it when he had it 65 meters out from goal. Um, he scored our last point of the game from over nearly 75 meters yesterday, um, with more to spare. So that, that's that's the result of relentless uh, work uh, and practice um, before training, after training. A guy who was just single-minded about being the best he can possibly be. Um, and that's that's easy to say because everybody wants to be great. Uh, you know, everybody wants to be the best the best they can be. But really, who who puts in the work? Who puts in the time to actually grow and develop the way Garod has in the last five years? Um, he didn't score in the 2018 final, and in the last three finals, he's scored something like three twelve or something like that. More, more. Sorry, it's, it's it was it's three three fourteen. So. You know, go you take a look at that and, and take a look at at, an, at a person's growth and mentality for for the big stage. That development is that on the back of a conversation with some of the management, or how does Grow come to that realization that he needs to that, work on that? That's that's very so. There's there's definitely coaching. So and we've got exceptional coaching in Limerick. Um, but uh, coaching coaching can be an echo chamber if if you don't have a listening ear. So really, it has to come from the individual. It absolutely has to come from the individual. So even um, when so Garod was playing wing back on the under twenty one team, the one the All Ireland uh, or twenty one team. So you know he even changed his mentality in terms of the movement and the and the different skill set that's required for the forwards um, when he moved over to to, to the senior team. So, um, you know, I would I would put 90% of that on, on his mentality and his his just innate competitiveness and drive because he's he's an incredibly driven person. Like he's, uh, you know, it's it's not it's not normal. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's not every team has one. Um, and he's had his ups and downs over the last couple of years. But you know, you can. It speaks to his own resilience that even through tough patches in the, like even in last year's semi final when he had a tough day and 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 was substituted, he came and scored two two in the Iron final against Cork and and really kind of buried them with those two goals. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it speaks to his resilience. It's like I mean, it's, it's it is really interesting. Like they, I mean, nobody would ever have thought he was a bad hurler or said anything like that in eighteen. But to go from yeah. that to one of the best players in 
in, in that team, if, if not the best, is is pretty extraordinary. Like mm-hmm. for for anybody listening, like what what specifically were the, were the drills he was doing, like to, to try and improve that particular element of his game, or or what was the specific uh, work so, that he was doing? So this is one of the things. This is one of the things that was kind of instigated uh, by Paul Kenrick uh, in in around uh, again so at seventeen uh, when he was part of the coaching setup uh, was so before training uh, the forwards. Uh, they have there's kind of zones uh, with about a dozen two dozen slitters in it um, either side of the field by around the 65s you go in before training instead of pucking in twos across the field which is probably the greatest waste of time in in our in our game uh, you deliberately pick and strike five balls on the run um, and uh, or take your scores nobody's watching you there's no pressure on you there's there's nobody taking count of what you've missed or what you scored. It's you just uh, as a as a forward practicing your striking. Uh, defenders were off doing something different uh, on the other end of the field. Um, but uh, before you started training as a forward, uh, you had struck. You know a lot of them would have struck in 30, 40 balls, uh, and they'd have kept score was themselves as to how many they missed. A lot of them did not like to miss. I can imagine. I can imagine it's a very very competitive group on the inside yeah. there. Yeah, big time. Like, and that's kind of the scary thing when you think about what's going to happen over the next few years is that Kilkenny or Limerick were absolutely awesome yesterday and there are still different bits and pieces you can point to where there's potential improvement or the key and Lynch factor, obviously, uh, as, uh, as, a, as a potential improvement squad-wise. So, like, I mean, I mean, William O'Donnell, who just said there, they hate being asked about next year given they won the All-Ireland less than 24 hours ago. But you must be thinking, Seamus, they've got a hell of a chance of emulating Kilkenny in the 2000s. Listen. So they're on top until they're knocked off, and, yeah. and that's the reality. And so, like, you're, you, it's, it's the reality of being king of the hill. I said to a good friend of mine in Clifton there recently. I said that you know, as nervous as I was about going up to the Kilkenny game, I, I said that you know, Limerick are, are champions until they're, until they're, until they're not, until they're beaten, and they're an exceptionally hard team to beat. Um, ask, ask Claire uh, this year. Like if anybody if anybody had a right to say that, that they were good enough to beat Limerick this year, it was probably them earlier this year. But they were Limerick refused. Uh, I think Declan Declan said it yesterday um, that it was just stubbornness uh, that uh, that kind of won out in the end. That Limerick just kind of refused to lose. Um, and, and I think that's there's there's a lot of truth in it. Uh, it's it's that ability to to dig it out and been so used to winning that losing really you you know we're, we're not. It's it's not in our it's not in our mindset. It's not in our vocabulary. Uh, William was saying that you know when John Kiley took over, uh, obviously nobody was talking about three in a row, four in a row. It was about ending that long, long wait, and I, I don't even know how much belief there was that that was going to happen so quickly. When you stepped away f- from this team, having got that medal, did you did you did you think this team was going to go on to the greatness that they've gone on to? So there's absolutely no doubt that when I decided to step away in 18, um, uh, I first thing I had to make peace with was I, I was convinced they were going to do it in 19, uh, and could I be happy sitting at home uh, when when they were when they were going to go again? So I was I was convinced that 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 was they were a special group, that even the landscape around them uh, and the teams around them that the, you know, there wasn't much going to, to catch them or touch them. And the key thing for me then was the continuity of the management team that they have, a uh, phenomenal management team uh, you know, that, that John has assembled and curated, managed. Like it's, a, it's been a long period of time uh, for Limerick Hurling to have such a steady group of people. I know success breeds that, but you know, there's commitments, there's commitments off the field, away from the team that can pull really key contributors you know, when I think of, you know, there's so many key contributors like Shawnee O'Donnell, uh, the likes of a Jero O'Connell, everybody keeps mentioning because he's such a special, special man, yeah. uh, the kid man. Um, you know, the Conor McCarthy's, the liaison. So, you know, the, there's so many special people that when you take them out, there's a discontinuity there uh, and there's something different to change. You have to adapt to that change. So, um, you know, that has been that has been one of the key things to to keep this moving. So, yeah, I, I knew they were going to be special. I knew that I knew I knew this was on the cards. Um uh, I was surprised in 19 when, when when they won the league and won Munster in the fashion that they did that they came up short in the semi. So, yeah. um, you know, th- th- that was what this is what they're capable of. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, Seamus, you might stick with us on the line there because we're going to go to one of your former teammates there at the hotel again. I think we've got Dermot Burns on the line. Good morning to you, Dermot. How are you getting on? 
Morning, lads. How are we doing? All good. How are you keeping? You're up bright and early. The celebrations, obviously, uh, were pretty good last night. You're after interrupting my breakfast, but sure, look, I'll forgive you. (laughs) Full fry up? No, no, I've bought a fruit in front of me. We won't jump to assumptions. (laughs) Wow. I mean, you're you're, you're still staying a model professional, even uh, the morning after winning in All-Ireland. Ah, it's grand. Yeah, it's grand. Sure, look, it's... Keep the routine, you know. How are you keeping? How shamey? Is he on the line there? Hi, <laughs> Jeremy, boy. How are you, Shamey? Morning. <laughs> you tired, Jeremy? Yeah, yeah, look. It's fair me. Just sure. Uh, tired just now. Can, uh, take a boy for a while. I drove through. You'd be on an awful I, high. I, so I, drove Patrick's well. I drove through Patrick's well. They're building your statue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. Yeah, sure, look. <laughs> no, no, there's not more b- bigger legends than myself out there, so no. <laughs> uh, not this year, Jeremy, not this year. Sunday game, hurler of the year. The uh, personal accolades are going to be coming quick and fast. Ash, look at you. That's look, it's nothing you ever achieve out to, or set out to achieve. But look, that's nice little touch, I suppose. But look, the main thing is we got the win yesterday and uh, a great team performance. So it was great. Yeah, it's been a hell of a season. Is uh, taking long range freeze in an All Ireland final in Croke Park any different to what you're doing in training? Uh, no, I always just try to keep my routine the same, I mean, no matter where I am uh, in the field in Patrick's Well. Um, lucky enough and blessed to be in Croke Park. Um, no, just trying to keep the routine the same, no matter where you are or who you're playing or what the situation. Was there ever any doubt that you weren't going to put that one between the posts with that, that one right in front of the hill uh, in the first half yesterday? Oh, my memory now is scattered this morning. Um, on your own yeah, 21, wasn't it? it, it oh, yeah. That, yeah, in the first half. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know who was outside me. I usually look for whoever's inside the inside line to make a run. So you can blame the lads and the inside didn't make any runs. So I said, I'll give, I'll give it a go. So you can blame the lads for that. <laughs> um, like, it, it, was, it was a remark. Like, I mean, there's not even, what I'm wondering is, there's not even a conversation around that. Is there, you're kind of thinking, wind at the back. This is definitely going, going over the bar. I oh, know, I think Hago was outside me. And right. He just signaled, he just looked at me and he just put the hand up like that. And I was like, geez, I was myself, I'm a bit far out here, Hago. <laughs> um, but no, look, look, probably just the right connection, the right time. Look at it. There's never and a wrong over. time to shoot, Dermot. There's never a wrong time to shoot, my man. Yeah, yeah. Let the shooter shoot, Jimmy. You'll be a shooter yourself now. <laughs> Do you remember the, Seamus was just saying how you know one of the great things is being able to share the success uh, with family with friends with supporters I'm just wondering though about the group and you know all Ireland winners often talk about shutting the door in the dressing room afterwards and it's just the 35 players the backroom team the people who've been there through the long slog during the winter did you, did you have that moment yesterday? Uh, yeah as shame, as shame you know is like the most important hour or two. I'd say we're in dressing room for two plus hours after the game. We were lucky enough to go back out onto the field and take a couple of photos. Um, obviously, due to COVID, last couple of years, we didn't even get the cup to get that photo. Uh, spend a bit of time in the dressing room. Um, no, they are special moments. And like, if we could just take a second or two just to capture those moments in the dressing room or have a chat or the listen to the songs that are being played, just look around you, just smiles on the lads' faces and just suppose that makes it all worthwhile, you know. Mm. Is it, they're almost kind of like a, uh, do you learn about trying to soak those moments and do you get better at it over time? I've been very fortunate the last couple of years and I, like I always say, we're blessed to be a part of this group um, from 18 and have a big experience like a shame, Tom Condon, those lads, you know, coming through as a young lad. And you now I suppose being one of the senior lads on it, like you do, you do kind of take a second to reflect on where you are at that moment in time, and just I suppose appreciate it and enjoy it. Like Seamus obviously mentioned there, the possible statue going up in Patrick's Well over the, the mm. next few years. Like, in fairness, I mean it is remarkable that Patrick's Well does have three centre points of of that team, and it obviously Keane not playing yesterday. Do yourself and Aaron and Keane get? A quiet moment after these finals. Do you, do you appreciate the, the the parish and the club as much as you do the the county side of things? Oh, always, um, always. Like we, we always have a we get our group photo up. We're, we're very fortunate to have a, a couple of photos now in those situations. So there's stuff we look back on in years to come. But 
we always do get an opportunity to take a moment for ourselves and just, I suppose, appreciate one another in that moment, you know. Uh, Seamus, is uh, Dermot Burns your hurler of the year? Well, you know, he, he's, uh, but it was it, it was earned, it was earned before yesterday. Yesterday with the cherry on, on, on top, but like, and it's uncomfortable for players to talk about these things because they're not things you want to talk about. They're not things that you set out uh, to actually do on an individual level. Dermot just played his game all year and he was brilliant doing it. And it's been one of those things for over the last three years. He's been getting better every single year. Um, and this is probably the culmination of it. So, you know, without without Dermot's freeze in the Munster final, without Dermot's uh, resilience against Galway in the dying minutes, uh, and again, just long range the that he has. The only surprise I had was that when he took the free from the, the his own 21 yesterday that didn't go over the bar, I was... If I was a betting man, I would have thought I was, I was going straight between the posts. Uh, but you know, that's you know, he, it's it's the culmination of 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 again years of of, of growth development. I think we're just having a slight issue with that line as well, Dermot. What's the, the plan for the rest of the day now and for the next few days? Um, I'm going back up to bed now for a nap. Good stuff. <laughs> um, no, um, I actually don't have the schedule now. Like I, I we have obviously the homecoming in. Um, this evening to get it grounds and that's going to be really special I think um, I know people keep referencing um, COVID but we've been so fortunate the last uh, couple of years but I suppose I remember 2020 driving home in the car by myself after games and now we get to travel together on the train and go back and have the homecoming and celebrate with friends and different people so that's going to be really special so we'll take that as it comes this evening now well, Dermot, it's been great chatting to you. Thanks, many for making time for Likewise, us this morning. Likewise, lads. Enjoy the okay. fruit. See you later. See you. Cheers. Hello, Dermot. Dermot Burns there on the line. Um, I mean, he's. Uh, I think we still have Seamus Hickey with us as well there. I think that's, like, he's unbelievably humble and that is something you get from a lot of those interviews. It is awkward uh, talking to somebody who may well be the, the all-star hurler of the year because I think their entire focus all throughout the year is on the collective and that's essentially what allows these individuals to, to progress and to excel on an individual level. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, like, is it Gerard Hegarty? Is it Aaron Gallam was, I think, the favourite coming into the final. But uh, Burns consistency over the entire season. And again, when you go through the league, you go through the Munster Championship campaign, like, they've beaten everybody. They've beaten absolutely everybody. And I think uh, Seamus made a really good point there that, you know, Clare and uh, Galway probably had their best performances of the season, yet still they couldn't beat them. And likewise, Kilkenny in the final. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a hell of a legacy this team is leaving Seamus. There's no real sense that they're going to stop anytime soon. Well, so like the, the, every year, every year everybody gets a year older. So like that's that's yeah. the reality of it. Kenny was a very young team. Um, Cork Sorry. would have a very young team from there. Sorry, Seamus. Sorry, Seamus. That line is just a little bit dodgy. We're going to try and dial you up there again and uh, and get you back on. Uh, just a few issues there this morning. Uh, you're with us here on OTBAM. It is 9.36. It's brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. We might try and get over to the hotel uh, for one last chat before we wrap up this morning. We're going to have plenty of uh, reaction over the course of the week as well. Plenty more analysis and we'll hopefully hear from John Kiley between now and the end of the week as well. No, no, we're done with the hurling after today. Only <laughs> it's uh, Kerry week after this, isn't it? Oh, golly. Coronation. Wait, wait, actually, are we in a strange situation this week where you might actually want Kerry to win? Uh, no, I, some form of abandonment of the game would be the preferred outcome, okay. I think, right now. I was walking into the game last week, the Kerry Dublin going, like, there's no, there's no. There's no good way this ends as a Mayo man when you have Dublin, Kerry and Galway as the last three teams uh, remaining in the All-Ireland. And no, I think, um, I think I'm going to side with Galway. I think you're going to side as a, as a fan? As, uh, okay. I think, yes. Um, you, know, you, you are particularly insufferable. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it won't just be one All-Ireland with Kerry. It'll be, all oh, we're going to dominate for the next decade. Uh, there's definitely going to be a statue built to David Clifford. So, you know, I spend a lot of time in Galway. Um, my family now live in Galway. You know, I've never had a massive hatred for Galway. You know, I'd, you know, it's the Roscommon side of uh, Connacht that I'd have more of an issue with. So, mm. listen, if, uh, if Galway go and perform, I'll be, I'll be delighted. I'll tell you one thing: the Limerick hurlers have uh, been anything but insufferable over the last few years. Any tip on that, Seamus, on how to stay humble as a winner? <laughs> I have no tip because uh, I'm on those <laughs> watching him. Uh, but the the reality of the situation is that you know, and I've seen I've seen it earlier this year. I don't know what you saw. Like, there's people a little bit 
tired of, of, of a team being on top. Uh, I know, and even the, the punishments that Limerick were getting off referees, the commentary that they were receiving, dirty player this, dirty player that. Um, different things coming in. You know, people people are kind of, they get, they get weary of the same team on top. Uh, it was the same with Kilkenny. Uh, when they were when they were going for the four in a row, for the five in a row, you know, a team that was so good, people were trying to pick holes in in, in how they were doing it, um, and that's that's part of it. And so it's really really important in those situations when you're the team in question that you stay really tight, and that's what Limerick have is an incredibly tight group. Nothing nothing picks out of it. Um, they're really really well bonded as a group of lads. You know, they've so many foreign holidays now in the last uh, four years now that they that they've they're, they'd want to be best friends at this stage, so this that, that's kind of important. But you know, the narrative of of sports media and for you know sports fans in general is, you know, a lot of people you know looking for a change yesterday, um, mm-hmm. even if that change was back to the uh, the dark feather and death star that is Kilkenny. Well, I I tell you one thing, like I mean, you're you're right on that, but I I do think that the manner in which Limerick have won over the last three games in particular uh, is good for the legacy of them in the eyes of the neutral. Not that that matters a jot to anybody from Limerick, but I, I do agree with you, maybe like if you compare them to, to the Dublin team of the last few years, just the, the way they were killing off opposition so easily. And I think that maybe kind of fed into the boredom that people had around them. The fact that Limerick were in a war against Clare, in a war against Galway and in a war against Kilkenny probably makes them more likeable in the eyes of the public. Again, that doesn't matter one bit to Liberty. They don't care one bit what the, the neutral man thinks of them. But but that, I think, might be the reality. Yeah, but, but, but it takes me back then to the... So, again, draw parallels to, to, to what I know. Like So, the, the, the 9 uh, and 10 finals with Kenny Tipperary yeah. being you know, two of the greatest games I've ever seen in my entire life, um, where you, you just had... You had high quality, entertaining games, um, and Kilkenny were put to the pin in their collar, and had to produce something that was that was special within them to to get over the line in 09. And they took their licks in in ten, and then came back uh, in eleven. So it's um, it, it's it, there is something endearing about you know a champion that that earns it. And like you said, having you know been undefeated in 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 Munster, beaten everybody in Munster, uh, it took extra time to do it. For, Clare, uh, and then beating the two Leinster finalists. Uh, you know, there, there, there really isn't, there isn't, there really isn't a, a championship gambit that you can run that 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 is better than what Limerick have run this year. Um, and, and so I suppose you know that there is a sense, you know, even for within Limerick, uh, in terms of the achievement this year. And John Kiley kind of alluded to it yesterday. You know, it's been a tough six months. It's been, it's been relentless, and uh, and and they've been getting both barrels for a, a, quite a while now. Yeah. So. It's it's uh, it's good to get to the end of it. We're going to go to one of your former teammates, uh, one of your last former teammates now for uh, another chat. It is Nicky Quaid, I think we have on the line live from the team hotel. Nicky, how are you getting on? Hi lads, how's things? Very well. We've got a beaming Seamus Hickey here on the line as well. Uh, <laughs> best stuff, best stuff. How, how are you getting on this morning, Nicky? Flying it, yeah. Sure, look, I suppose you can't, can't be but happy this morning. It's a um, great feeling waking up. Like. What was the best part about the celebrations yesterday? Um... I suppose it's hard to put into words. Me, me, I suppose me for me, I love being, you know, maybe in a dressing room after just with the group. I suppose everyone that kind of has, you know, put everything in for so long together, um, just being in their company for, I suppose it's probably the ones of an hour, or whatever it is after the game. It's, um, yeah, those kind of moments are special, and obviously getting to meet your family and things then out in the field. There, those things are things that you never forget. You've got a bird's eye view of what's happening uh, throughout the seventy minutes. What was your sense of the the performance of your teammates? Um, I, I, to be honest, I thought we played well. Um, I did think we, we we performed well. We worked very very hard, and I suppose look, we put the pin of our collar by Kilkenny. We didn't really expect anything else. You know, there's there's such a competitive bunch. Um, but I suppose we we I think I don't think if I'm right, I don't think they ever led. They got back level a couple of times in the second half, and I suppose for me, the fact that they couldn't get ahead of us was probably a little positive. And any time they did get level or within a point, we maybe pushed it to a point again, or maybe pushed it to two. Um, so that was, suppose, a, a huge, a huge part for me, like just kind of showing our character and resilience. There's been a lot of talk uh, about the celebrations and how they've differed to the last couple of years, but also, uh, I guess, from your perspective, the, the fact that the atmosphere in an All Ireland final is so different from the last couple of years. I presume that that plays into things when you're trying to keep a cool head, especially over puckouts. Um, yeah, look, it does it. It does. It, I suppose, obviously, you you know, you, you, you understand the time of the game and you know, what's at stake and that. But I suppose, look, you have to trust yourself and the process and to kind of 
I suppose uh, have courage and take some risks maybe to get the rewards and certain things and um, I just think I thought our, our half hour line especially yesterday was immense um, you know, that the work and the running that they did off the ball to create space and things like that I thought they were, I thought they were outstanding Yeah they were absolutely awesome uh, like I think as well from in front of you as well your own full back line your, your own set of defenders as a whole they did a pretty good job to say the least Nicky just in terms of quelling the influence that Kilkenny were trying to get out of someone like TJ Reid that big high ball going down just in front of you actually was their constant tactic yeah, and I suppose look, that's one they're very good at that. There's some very good lads in, in the air and things, and obviously, you know, we, we we expected that. And to be fair, our lads dealt with it very, very well because it's not easy, you know. Want the ball as they were raining in, and they have a lot of big men. And John like said good lads in the air, so it wasn't easy. But I think I thought our lads were, were were very good in that regard, and then very disciplined as well. You know, didn't give away many cheap frees, especially down the home straight. I thought we were very disciplined as well. Four All Ireland titles in five years, Seamus. It's fair to say, I none this would have happened if it wasn't for Nicky in the semi final in 2018. Well, listen, none of it would have happened without Nicky in 18, 19, 20, and 22. Like you know, it's um, it, it's it's hard to overstate how important the the set piece is for Limerick and, and how important the start is in winning our own puck out. Um, you know, speaking to how well the half forward line play. You know how patient Nicky was yesterday, waiting for runs to develop. Because it was such a hot day, it took guys a few seconds longer to get back, settle, take a breather, and then make their run. Nicky was patient. He was patient, and you know, you know, from the history of, of Limerick goalkeepers, you know, being patient often is its own reward. Um, and, and Nicky is, you know, he's the rock that we build that on. So, you know, aside from changing nappies this morning, you know, uh, I'd say uh, <laughs> yesterday. Yesterday's, yesterday's performance was probably handy dandy be compared to I was going to say surely you deserve a day off but considering you've probably been out of the house four or five nights a week training for <laughs> the last nine months yeah. uh, he's, he's, he's running around here actually he's looking after me there for a minute he's flying around the lobby here yeah <laughs> where the, young, the younger lads will be stretching this uh, you know you, you might get today and tomorrow the younger lads will be stretching it into Thursday Friday I'd say you might be expected back home a bit earlier <laughs> uh, sure look we'll, we'll, we'll play it we'll see how it goes we won't, we won't, uh, we won't worry about that no, we'll get over today first and see how it goes after that Seamus touched on it earlier about you know when you are when you are the winners and the big dogs and everyone's coming looking for you they assess every part of your game plan and I'm wondering if you noticed uh, much of a difference in terms of the opposition on your puck out strategy um, It's hard to know I suppose really I suppose the thing you do know is at the moment is that you know, every team is definitely bringing their best when, when, they're, when they're up against us you know and Look, that's I suppose that's that's a privilege for us that you know we're in that position at the moment that you know every team has to bring their best to try and try and beat us and and like that so we're, we're privileged to be in that position at the moment. It just means that we have to get the best out of ourselves every day we go out as well to make sure that we, we come out on top. Given the record of the Quaid family, I dare say that that child uh, will be running around that hotel maybe in the future as well. <laughs> Well, look, so once he's healthy, that's all that matters. I mean, that's all that matters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Goalkeeper, what age do you? So, but we give it about another 18, 20 years. So, there might be a gap for somebody else to get in in between. Is <laughs> a year and a half at the moment. Anyway, so all right, give, we give, give him a couple of decades. Uh, here, you've been in the play, squad, what? About play outfield for everything, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've been in the squad about, what, 12, 13 years at this stage. Can can you believe the heights you've managed to get to? I don't want to be honest. Sure. Sometimes you kind of have to pinch yourself and like, I suppose when I when I first got into the squad at Limerick, you know, winning one other would would have been, you know, I thought it thought it might never happen for years. Like so, look to 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 be sitting here now and have one four of them. It's it's incredible, really, and look, it's not something I suppose that you kind of dwell on when you're in the mix. It's just going to go move from match to match and things like that. But I'm sure in years to come when we sit down, we'll reflect on on the achievement, and it's it's obviously a it's a great feeling. Nicky, congratulations again. Enjoy the celebrations. We'll chat to you again soon. Thanks a million, lads. Thanks very much. Thank you. And of course, Seamus, thanks a million as well for being with us this morning. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's a great feeling to be here this morning. Yeah. It is. Good stuff, Seamus. You can imagine. Uh, great stuff there from everybody at the team hotel there in Seamus Hickey, of course, over the last little while. Nathan, thank you for joining us in studio. We'll uh, have you on again over the course of the week. OTBAM has been brought to you by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. And we're back tomorrow morning from half past seven where we're chatting to rugby statistician Derek McNamara, the former Leinster forward Mike McCarthy and David Herity as we continue our reaction to this weekend's incredible rugby and hurling. Right now, we're leaving you with Tommy Welsh reflecting on yesterday's All-Ireland final. Enjoy and see you tomorrow. We owe the cameras for the interview. Possibly will he be getting the man of the match off yeah, then, maybe? I'd say so. Yeah. Yeah. What would you think, Jeff? Yeah, I, I think so in terms of the points in general play. You know, like himself and Daryl Chegarty were very good. You know, defence-wise again, like to me, last year, McBurns has hurt the year. You know, mm. like, 
as a wing back and he's free taken. Uh, his defensive side of it, his aerial ability, he's been brought the game to a complete new level. The Limerick lads are, are emotional there, Tommy, as you would be when not Ireland. John Kiley is, is fairly moved there now. They're under pressure. They are, and you see, I suppose, uh, Kilkenny is such a, you know, a, a powerful force in Ireland from when Ireland began. Uh, it does mean more. It's like beating your rivals or your neighbours. It means so much. Well, when you're one of the, say, the, the part of the rising pack as such, you know, like Limerick, while well, they started brilliant in the 30s and that, and uh, they're all around this 1973, you know, then they're out of sorts, really, for the next, you know, 30 or 40 years until the mid-90s team, and with a good team just didn't have the luck to get over the line. And now, this great team, you know, and, that's, and it could have all been so different. They were six points down against Cork in the semi-final in 2018. They came back. You probably hear the chorus of cheers here in Cobart behind me. That's John Kiley going over to see would it be his, his daughter, but it's the little girl anyway. I went to the two little girls out onto the, the, the Hallow Turf and uh, meeting the fans. I see Declan Hannan is getting a slip. He's with Keen Lynch, I'd say, is going to lift the McCarthy Cup with him. That's a lovely gesture because we must remember Keen Lynch on, on this day. Yeah, it, just looking at him there, Tommy, it's kind of hard to know. How, like, how, what are your feelings at this moment? For, for Keen for Lynch? Keen, yeah. Oh, we're just so proud of the lads. You see, he's been here and been here on so many days. When you've been there, you would have little envy. Or, he has been there and done that. So I'd say he's just so proud to see the other lads, you know today, some of the subs that came on, scoring great points, young violent came on, Cotton O'Neill, some lads in that Limerick team possibly getting their first all Ireland medal, and some of them getting their first on the, the field of play, but yeah, it, it, this is probably sad for him too, but listen, isn't that a lovely gesture that Declan Hand is bringing him up, he's on crutches, he's in a boot, and a uh, two-time hurler of the year, um, you know, and uh, what a fantastic role model Keane Lynch is to the the, the people of Limerick, you know, I see Graham Mulcahy going down there, I see Nicky Quaid lifting his young child out onto the field. You mentioned the children coming onto the field uh, in the in the football uh, for, for Kerry in Dublin. Well, we see it here today again, the sub goalie bringing his, his uh, child onto the field as well. Just fabulous memories and fabulous moments. See, Gerard Hegarty was going over to do an interview a couple of minutes ago. What a game he has had, you know, a, a year where... I suppose he wasn't at his total best, but he seems to save his best for, for the big day. He is a big personality, and he does usually turn up. And, and that's no kind of slight against anyone that had to pick up him up today, because in a lad of his size, six well, this, five, this, this is, And Jeff was saying the same. Like, I think, Tommy, your feeling now is Kenny Mann, exactly almost what Galway people felt have semi-final. Hurled unbelievably well, but it's very, very hard to deal with that physicality and that half-forward line. It is, and, 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 and elegance and skill and... Uh, you know, touches and like the goal he got, like like that was straight into you know the ring that goes around the top corner. <laughs> like I'd imagine that's where it went because mm, yeah. like Carmel Costello in the football against Kerry there last weekend, when you play against the top goalies, there's only certain places you can button to where you're sure to hit the back of the net, and that was one of them. And you're taking on Owen Murphy, and by God, and that's not the first time he mm. scored in many All Ireland finals and Munster finals. He just has that beautiful elegant touch, and and when you win the a game by two points as well like after he scored a point in the 70th minute where he got the ball out was tackled hard by a Kenny defender I'm sure it was a David Blanchfield and really put it up to him and he shrugged him off at the very end but glided the ball over the bar on the run with his right hand he could score right or left from about 70, 75 yards out they're, they're, they're conditioning Tommy um, you know obviously it's, it's, a, it's a huge part of what to do but in terms of their skill level like when you talk to tactics all day but for big men their, their skill level is, is as good as I've seen any of even in your time yeah their, their, their skill level is here and you back up with their size like when we were here they're lifting up the, or their, Larry is giving the cup here now to Declan Hannan they're shaking hands Keen Lynch is beside him yes lift it together and there's the fireworks as, 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 a, as a Limerick person Tommy whether you're a supporter or whether you're a player or whether you're a, a, a father or whether you're John Kiley who we're seeing this is just a special special moment in your life it's a special moment and like 
you have to look at all the different backstories as well. Like Peter Casey came on, 12 months out with cruciate knee ligament injury. His brother suffered the same feat. He was watching his fellow players going up, lifting the McCarthy Cup and picking up their all Ireland medals on the field of play. He's out there today. Peter came on. Some of the subs that came on. This is huge for them. And as well as the. Like, it's huge for them to do the three in a row. There's no point in saying otherwise. It's, it's absolutely massive. I think Brian Cody said it before when Kilkenny did it in 2008. Madness, really, in this day and age. And um, Jeff, they're, they're just a likeable team, actually. They're likeable lads. They're, they carry themselves with good grace as well for all their physicality and strength. I had to do, like, you know, like when King came up to us at Christmas time, you know, I'm a very grounded, humble guy, like, mm. you know, um, I'm trying to pack. Mm, non, non, non drinker, you know, but enjoys the pass, you know, you want the lads and enjoy the nightlife and all that. Mm. Um, but, you know, just, I, I'd say it comes from the management team, probably like Tommy's time with Cody, you're grounded, you're humble. Mm. Um, and if anyone steps out of line or gets above their station, they're quickly nailed. Mm. Um, because at the end of the day, look, they've, they've, won, they've won the last three, they could have won five in a row, you know, and Kenny took them that day. Um, well, where are they then, actually, Tommy, in terms of the great hurling teams? Ah, so listen, you can't judge them Johnny yet, as they are, mm. where do they lie? But where are they going? Mm. They well, are they're, they're four out of five, it could be five out of five. Ah, well, it could be, you know, you can't go with could be, you know. <laughs> some teams could have won ten in a row. You know, if Shea was starving, he had to score that goal. <laughs> You know, Shoulda, woulda, coulda. Yeah, I, I, sure I just think that in relation to their coaching um, and management, they're ahead of the curve yeah. in a lot of counties, and it's up to. You got to, it's, it's, but it's like the old Kilkenny. You had to reach the Kilkenny level. Yeah. Now the likes of Kilkenny have to reach Limerick's level. I'm better than Tommy. Absolutely, and like the amazing thing probably for this group of players is the consistency of how many of them are starting all the time. Mm. Like just 13 of these guys are starting today. Are started. The All Ireland final in 2018, which was five years ago, which is amazing. That's incredible. Yeah, <coughs> usually if you go on a long run like that, you're introducing new players, like say Alex Ferguson would have done, like Bill Belichick, like any of the mm. you know long running teams. They can introduce new players, but this team seems to introduce them off the bench um, as opposed to starters. I was supposed to have had a few different runs of injury, so that might miss out this year, so he's motivated the following year. Mm. But to keep it going, like say these guys are four All Ireland medals. They say the Kilkenny team or the Kerry team or the Dublin team, they had eight and nine All Ireland medals and ten. So for them, I suppose, Johnny asked the question, where will they lie? And it's, you know, in history, in, when you're judging them against the very best, probably if they want to go to seven and eight and nine medals, they will probably have to see some new guys coming out of this academy. Now, what they do have is they're all still very, very young. So they're not an aging team even. But, um, the advantage they have over everyone else, if you take the gym out of it, yeah. When, when we were on that Kenny team that time, Walter Welch was our biggest player, and it was kind of probably court as well, but uh, Walter Welch was six foot five. Limerick have about five lads, six foot yeah. five. It, it's, a, it's a conversation that I had with my own coaches over the years, and even with academy stuff. Do, do you go for athleticism and size? Um, I know you have the late developers, but genetically, you know, if you want to compete with these lads, you're going to have to pick six foot one, six foot two guys and, and develop their skill if, if it's lacking uh, and get them ready to take these guys on because, look, our, our, our county players would, wouldn't be small guys now either. Um, but I think, I agree with you, Tommy, in terms of they're going to be judged on what they're going to be over the next three, four years um, and who, who's going to be able to compete with them. Right, I, I think the other thing that he's mentioned here, Tommy, is like, and Jeffrey spoke about this, and even I think uh, earlier on we heard Vincent Hogan talking about back in 1980, Galway won the All Ireland for the first time in so long. Galway to win two games to win All Ireland in those days. Limerick have to come out a Munster. Like Munster is like it's like an enigma wrapped in a vest in terms of how competitive it is. They have to keep coming out a Munster, and they just keep doing it. They do. They keep doing it, and nearly at the rees for a lot of games. Mm. As regards the, the, the you know the scoring cushions that the that they have by the end of the game. I'm not saying they're easy games, Ryan, but they do win most of the matches, bar maybe when they're playing clear. They win most of the matches by... When they have to win them, we'll say. Sometimes at the end, they're after doing so well in the early parts, there's no pressure on them in game four, game five. So, um, yeah, no, listen, it's incredible. Like, to, to do it every, basically every two weeks, 
as every week during the round robin, every two weeks after that, it is it is amazing in fairness. Does it, Tommy? Doesn't it? Do you know that discourse or the, the discussion or debate was on about Leinster and Munster hurling and, and the difference in standard? I, I don't I don't agree with that. I don't believe in it. To be honest with you, because you can judge it there now. Um, what Kenny had done against Clare and then Galimric and what Galway did. Did, did you buy into that rhetoric that was there at the time? Ah, no, I didn't because, um, you know, I knew how good the, the teams coming from Leinster were. Like, you know, you had Wexford nearly put, you know, nearly put one over on Clare. You had Galvish did, uh, you know, terrifically well all year. Uh, bar probably the Leinster final or probably the one match they were disappointed with. But they went on and they beat uh, Cork and they nearly beat Limerick. And, you know, can Kenny listen to that will all it's probably part of the game isn't it Le- Leinster versus Munster and it creates stories and it creates battles and rivalries but no listen we're a very proud very proud province and I know Galway aren't in it but say, as regards the Leinster Championship we're very proud of the Leinster Championship and uh, some fantastic teams in it you know any regrets from a Kilkenny perspective today? I don't think so yeah um, I don't think so um, it was uh, Adrian Mullins wide Probably at a key time, and probably the only mm. uh, Ricky Reed's why Tommy. Um, them two chances were the only two you kind of could say that at a key. That's going to happen in a game. Going to happen yeah. in a game. Like he took everything else. Like yeah, they were. You know, you never regret mistakes. If you're not making mistakes, you're probably not showing up. You know, in the first place. So I would never worry about wides as such, as long as they're not silly wides. And they were definitely points as well. There were, you know, there were, there were good chances of scores in fairness, and probably eight times out of ten, them fellas would put them all over the bar. But when you're Tom McKinney, like the score 226 today, uh, it would win most games. You would imagine. I felt for Kenny to win the game, they would have to keep Limerick say under 25 points 25 points or under because I felt in the semi-finals that four of the fours were taken off and they scored 27 points against Galway which I thought was a remarkable feat what other team could do that today they scored 31 points and um, they were just back to their very best really on the outside line now if you look at the inside lines the Kilkenny matchups were terrific and uh, you'd have to say um Hugh Lawler got the better of Aaron Galan, you know, because he got great ball in, but the big long arms of Hugh and the speed of Hugh, he was able to get the flick at the right time. I saw Mikey Butler, he did a great job, and Graham Mulcahy. Um, and Tommy Welch was on Flanagan, and Flanagan was taken off. So I think the Kenny pull back line were immense today, especially with the amount of ball that was coming in. And the half hour line then, like, I think the way it is now, anyway, it's like soccer as such. It's not like an hour day where, you know, you hear people saying, did you keep your man scoreless? Or how did you go on versus your marker? You can't really do that in the modern game because you have to defend sometimes up on him. Other times you have to be covering back. You have to be doing a bit of everything. So the movement is just terrific. The movement out of half hours. I'd hate to be playing going yeah. that way. <laughs> the best game. Yeah, yourself now and, and Darrod Hegarty or Kyle Hayes would be... Uh, Good matchup. <laughs> It'd be a good matchup. It'd be tough. But like there, just the images there. Nicky Quaid with one of his kids, and you know Graham Mulcahy's 32. That is the mad thing, Tommy. That stat you had about the 13 players. They've only one outfield player in his 30s. Is that it, Jay? Graham Mulcahy. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar.